All right, a very warm welcome to everybody here in the room. Uh, this is already our third Cybercation event uh, this year with the name of Cybercation 2024. And we are the side event also uh, for the Cyber Battle Nordic Baltics, which is just next door over here. Uh, but, and, and our entire focus of today's event here is to shape the future of education in cybersecurity. And I don't think this comes as a surprise to absolutely anybody here in the room uh, that there is a massive, massive skill gap and then also workforce cap in cybersecurity fields, in a lot of fields. Just to give you some of the numbers, by globally, we are missing around 4 million people working in a cybersecurity field. And I'm not going to even start talking about the skill gap that we are also facing. So this is the exact aim of the event today, to discuss about how we can get over the skill gap, especially in the Nordic uh, Baltic sector here, uh, or the countries, I, I would put it that way. And, and we are going to discuss about the better, very best case study that has worked in one country or another. And, and that's why also today we have a lot of people here from the policy sector, also people from the private sector, and also academia, because I think with the collaboration is the only way that we can actually find the very best solutions to really solve these uh, challenges that we are facing uh, today as well. And then, of course, also uh, when we think about uh, the new technologies, new innovation in cybersecurity, today's uh, focus will be, of course, also on the AI, because uh, AI can both provide us uh, opportunities and at the same time also challenges uh, by really uh, solving these issues in, in cybersecurity. And the event is actually organized together with the Nordic Council of Ministers office in Estonia and also CTF uh, Tech. Uh, and, and also uh, some of the practical information before I'm going to ask uh, the first uh, speaker here on the stage. Um, as you can see, everybody are wearing the uh, headsets as well. Um, so, uh, you have, to, you have two kind of different options there, so uh, two different channels. Um, if you want to stay with us, and I really, really recommend to do it, uh, then you have this with the blue color. Uh, but if you also click on, on one of the sides of your uh, headphones, uh, then you can also jump to uh, the cyber battle. But I can just warn you uh, that every time that you change this to red, I can see that, so that I can know that uh, that you're not with us uh, at the moment as well. Uh, but um, some of the more additional information, so uh, we would be very, very happy if you would also join our conversations by asking questions. Uh, for this, we have a program called Slido, uh, and uh, just for the technical team, can we show that on the background? Yes. As you can see, uh, either you can go and enter with the, uh, with the code, uh, or also there is a chance that you can just uh, scan this QR code. I, I hope that I'm not plucking your view here. Uh, so you can scan the code and then you can also submit all of your questions that you have uh, for our speakers and also we have a couple of panels so that you can also join our, our panel discussions as well. And uh, besides this, also uh, just uh, again informing everybody here that we are live uh, on, on some of the, uh, again, social media channels, newspapers. Um, so I would be very, very happy uh, as you can see the cameras over there uh, that if you want to stand up uh, then please don't move on that direction here, so otherwise you're blocking, uh, you're blocking the view. Uh, so I would very much appreciate if anybody wants to leave the room for a second, uh, then, then please do it from uh, either from the left or the right side as well. Uh, but uh, enough of me at the moment. Uh, so I am more than delighted to ask uh, to the stage the very first uh, speaker. And uh, this is Maria uh, Krochev, uh, who is Director of Nordic Council Minister Office in Estonia, and who will uh, set the tone uh, again about uh, role in advancing cybersecurity education. So Maria, I am very, very delighted to ask you to join me here on the stage. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and uh, gentlemen, and uh, dearest, dearest colleagues, a very, very good morning to uh, all of you today. And thank you so much for joining us here at um, this year's uh, Cybercation and uh, the Nordic Baltic uh, Cyber Battle here uh, in the 2024 culture capital, Tartu, which is uh, especially nice. And thank you, uh, Annette, for the very, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, you did mention that uh, I addressed you uh, one year ago which is, uh, which is correct. And when I did so, I called out to all of you 
to all of us to up our game uh, on our work on cyber security. Now the question is, did we up our game? Did you up your game? Did I? I hope and I expect that by attending this event today, you have all made the very, very conscious decision as individuals, as government representatives, representatives of think tanks, academia, private sector, perhaps you're a teacher, to intensify your efforts uh, for a more ethical and safe uh, cyber environment. And you know what, what we do might feel like a drop in the ocean, a small, tiny contribution, but then, as we all know, those many, many drops and many, many small contributions will eventually make up that ocean. Today, I still see three quite major challenges um, that I would like to that I would like to mention. We see huge geopolitical challenges. They are near, they're far away. They result in uh, hybrid uh, warfare. They result in uh, attacks on banking systems. They result in media attacks, the health sector. And as you know, really aiming at interrupting governance and private sector operations. We see a lot of more sort of classical crimes. We see that um, we see a lot of data theft uh, from um, companies, from individuals, business interruptions. We see ransomware attacks um, happening over the phone, over email. And um, it's w when you look at some statistics, the statistics that we find seem to suggest that the challenges are not just here and around us, but they're actually growing. And our very good partner, uh, right here next door in the, in the cyber battle, that is uh, Telia, uh, have been describing to us that they are, um, they are actually blocking between one and 200,000 attacks, phone attacks in Estonia every week. Now, play around with those numbers a little bit, and that tells you something. And that's just, I mean, it's a big company, but it's just one. So, you know, multiply that with governments and the rest of the private sector and, and everything else in our, in our society. So these, uh, these cyber attacks is, is our big challenge. The other challenge is a skills uh, shortage. We know it's large, we know it's growing. We're not just struggling to, to attract individuals to, to work on these uh, matters, but we're also struggling to keep up with developments. Uh, those who wish to harm us are clever and they're fast, and it's really hard to keep up. A third challenge that I see is related to artificial inter intelligence an incredible opportunity, right? I mean, like, like, um, like all innovations, but it does involve risks. It is being misused and it can be misused. As we all know, these challenges are not respecting borders. Um, in fact, we're in this boat together. And if we're gonna get somewhere, we're gonna have to do it jointly. From the side of the Nordic Council of Ministers, I'd like to mention three things that we are doing uh, to up our game, uh, three things that we try to do as a, as a contribution. One of the things that I'd like to highlight is uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers um, for Digitalization. Uh, I know that some of you have, have been engaging uh, in this. This is actually the only one of our councils where the Nordic and the Baltic countries are all represented and represented on equal terms. 
I believe that that joint ownership being represented and, and owning a fora on equal terms is key to its success. We know that uh, Estonia has developed thick and fast over the last 30 years. And um, today, Estonia is really the, the leading lady when it comes to digitalization and digi solutions. Estonia is also um, very prominent on issues related to tech startups, this very agile way that you can start companies, you know, click, 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 and you start a, you start a company. Um, we're seeing uh, cybersecurity is, is a great strength in, in Estonia. Um, the education sector, by the way, look at the PISA scores at the moment. This country is doing something right. And um, what I'm trying to say here is that Estonia can really contribute and Estonia can really offer knowledge and inspiration to the Nordic countries. The Nordic countries can offer uh, knowledge as well in areas where they are strong, but this is exactly it. This makes a relevant uh, cooperation. The other thing I'd like to, to bring up is the Nordic Baltic Cyber Skills uh, think, tank, th think Tank and the Cyber Bridge Forum. Uh, some of it, its members are, are, are here today, um, and uh, we will be hearing uh, a little more about that later today. It's the first of its kind. It's a forum that brings uh, together experts and resources from all uh, eight countries, Nordic, Baltic countries. And they are really working to close the skills gap um, and to build digital uh, resilience. Last, I would like to mention uh, the very, very vision um, of my office. Uh, something that is not just close to our hearts, but is at the very, very core of our vision. And that is um, for a cooperation to be relevant, it needs to be a win-win. There needs to be mutual interest. There needs to be contribu contributions from all sides. And I just, I just mentioned some of Estonia's strengths. We know that Latvia and Lithuania have a lot of strengths as well, although I'm, I'm here on behalf of our office in, in Estonia. And again, Estonia can offer a lot in this partnership, and so can the Nordics. That's what makes it relevant. It's not a one-side uh, contribution. There's not one recipient and one provider. It goes both ways. It's win-win and it's relevant. That makes it sustainable. Uh, and within that picture, uh, it's, also it's, it's also important to remember that the five Nordic governments have never before been so vocal about prioritizing Nordic-Baltic cooperation as they are today. And that's a great momentum that we should nurture. I believe this area that we're here to talk about today is one of the key ones, one of the most relevant ones for, for our cooperation. I'm going to uh, give this floor to um, other individuals and, and experts um, soon through our excellent moderator, uh, Annette. And um, I'm here to welcome you, but soon you will actually be listening to those who really know this stuff. Um, and that's, um, that's the key takeaway from, from today. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, CTF Tech, uh, Telia, and perhaps uh, above all, my own team, who's also uh, with us here today. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great contribution from, from all of you. And for all the participants, we are all here to, to meet you and to tell you about our work and uh, see what, uh, what future cooperation we can, uh, we can bring together. So thank you, everyone. And uh, have a great day. And also, don't forget to visit the battle. It's actually great fun as well. So do take the, do take the opportunity. Thanks very much. So thank you very much, Maria. And it's always so incredibly lovely to hear somebody saying such lovely words about Estonia as well. So thank you very, very much.
Uh, so as the next speaker here, I am actually very, very excited to ask uh, Kaimo Gusk to join me here on the stage. He is the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Defence. Um, and uh, why especially this is so important, because uh, since the start of uh, the war in Ukraine, we have seen a massive, massive increase of also tax against different nations. So that's why also the military field is so important. So I'm really hoping to hear some, some uh, great kind of tips and, and strategies that the Defence Ministry is currently working with in order to make sure that we also are much more safe in, uh, in the military field. So the stage is yours. Good morning. Yeah, I'm coming from Ministry of Defence uh, and the topic of my today's morning speech is cyber is everywhere. It is actually everywhere. It's uh, behind this curtain in a massive concentration. It's around us uh, here in this uh, Originally, basketball room uh, I love as well. Uh, I had to admit that I'm coming from a time when it was not like that. Beginning of 1980s, when I was a small kid, TVs and radios had lamps, and uh, if they had a shaky picture, you fixed them with, uh, mildly said, knocking on those <coughs> technical things. I remember that it was roughly 1984 I found a piece of wood. I took a pen and I created a very wooden phone out of that. We even didn't have a landline uh, phone those days in my home, so I don't know where the idea came into my head, but I draw a screen there as well. Uh, very static one, lagged as hell, uh, actually standing because it was just a picture. And a bit more than uh, 20 years later, first iPhone was sold. I recognized it immediately. <clears throat> and then, well, the cyber area started or it was it was it was then when it it started to to roll it's now it's everywhere really it's banking it's uh, ticket offices it's uh, well entertainment uh, it's it's also vacuum cleaners uh, our security department in ministry of foreign affairs prohibited to use robot vacuum cleaners in our embassy in vilnius where i came from, because cyber is everywhere, and uh, as it gives you a lot of opportunities, it also contains risks. It's already mentioned cyber criminals, activists, state-origined uh, uh, actors as well. And you need to be ready for that. I, yeah, rightly said I was in Ukraine when large-scale war started. I was there before, and the cyber attacks were there before, from Russia against uh, Ukraine. They attacked uh, banks. Ukraine struggled, but uh, managed. They uh, attacked uh, government offices, uh, right before the large-scale war started, on the moment large-scale war started, and after that, uh, hitting Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine so hard that for weeks their email system, official email system, didn't function. They, I mean Russians, shoot the missiles uh, against the power stations, but in parallel they attacked with cyber means the SCADA of power stations to take the electricity out. So we sat there with, uh, well, blackouts. Four hours you got uh, electricity, four hours you didn't. Uh, again, four hours you got, and I put my laundry into washing machine, pushed the expert button, and <laughs> managed to do my laundry those days. Everything uh, went on on a battlefield, in a virtual world, but also in a physical world. When the majority of uh, diplomats came back to Kiev, uh, summer 2022, I got a call from French ambassador. 
in Kiev. I was sitting in my office in uh, in Estonian embassy between the breaks of the air alerts, and the French ambassador asked me, "Well, Kaimo, do you really organize a huge reception for the whole diplomatic corps during low circumstances?" I just looked the invitation I got from your embassy and I'm say, I, I said I answered to him no I'm, I'm not going to do the reception and I have not sent out the invitation it was a fake one with malware coming you know where from but it was so skillfully and masterfully done that it uh, fooled in a first glimpse uh, the one who opened it well, good, you have the contacts, you know the one who know the one, you make a call and you are certain that it was not, not the right one and you can already do the cybersecurity magic uh, layer practicing behind the curtain at the moment. Well, once again, cyber world, physical world uh, have uh, really joined together and the line between them is really, really blurry. It's happening here as well. Already mentioned the attacks against our, our government. Uh, for example, DDoS attacks against uh, Estonia has uh, raised four times during the Ukrainian war. We are getting uh, during one month as big amount of DDoS attacks as it was before the large-scale war started in Ukraine. But we are working against that, together with uh, good allies. We need to be resilient, because cyber is everywhere. We need to train, and that's why we are running a cyber range called CR14, meant for the different institutions to practice their capabilities there. This is why we are sending not only shells and well bullets for Ukraine to fight back Russian aggression, but also running the IT coalition together with Luxembourg and uh, other countries who have joined us to invest in to help Ukraine battle back, not only on a battleground, which quite often has been compared with the World War I. Actually, it's full of uh, cyber nowadays. The most, we can even call simplistic uh, weapon as artillery is full of cyber nowadays. So that's why we are investing into that. And this is why we all together organize this kind of event here today in Tartu, where we can practice how to defend ourselves, maybe even, I call it proactive defense, to do it in a more suppressive way. I wish you all a great day here in an environment where it is all around us a cyber. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kaiman. I will not let you do oh, well, leave no yet. Well, no well. Um, so our audience also have a, a chance to ask questions. As I can tell, like it's you know it's it's Friday morning, it's early, people are still a bit shy. Uh, it's it's a nice method. So if you can have again the the Slido uh, QR code and the number on the background, so that people could ask questions. But uh, until date, uh, they are you know thinking what they would like to ask. Uh, from my side, because my background is especially from the sure. Defence Ministry, uh, and I used to especially cover uh, cyber cyber security there. Something that uh, maybe you can you can tell our audience as well is that uh, the Ministry of Defense uh, is, is very, very also hardly working for the, uh, you know, 
uh, raising a bit of more uh, git, not the gits, but also like the future workforce in that sense, by doing the cyber conscription. So that besides actually going with nine to 12 months into the forest with your, with your gun, uh, you can also do nine months actually as, as a cyber uh, conscription, because that's kind of a compulsory thing for every guy who turns 18 here in Estonia. So maybe you can just uh, briefly talk about this, because is it still correct that we have seen like much more applications of people that would like to do uh, cyber con uh, conscription that we actually can actually even uh, accept all of these people. Uh, so it has become very, very, very popular. Well, the case is that for Estonia, the most uh, important, uh, let's call it natural resource is humans. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I always say that Estonia is not a small country, we are a compact country. I, I refuse to use Estonia as a small one. We are compact. So the amount of people are also compact. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to find for everybody the field they can uh, bring in their skills in 100%. Forest is fine. Gun is fine as well, actually. But uh, as the, the, the tools are so portable, you can do your cyber magic uh, also in the forest, uh, so uh, that's absolutely right. We we are picking and precisely picking the right persons to the right skills, and uh, that gives you the synergy. The same thing I mentioned about uh, Ukrainian war. The First World War trench battles actually include nowadays huge amount of cyber, so we need it. Yeah, I've been I've been always saying as well, like as uh, just for the information here in Estonia, like if you are a lady, uh, you don't have to do your uh, conscription, so it's not like uh, but you compulsory. Can. But, but th you can. This, is, this is what I wanted to say. So if I would be again 18, 19 years old, young uh, young woman, uh, which I'm not anymore, uh, so I, I would definitely use that chance to spend this nine months because I think that's kind of an experience if you can protect your st uh, state in in cyberspace and especially from the military side. Uh, that that's, that's an experience that you can never get from, from anywhere else. So, so that's uh, something that is, I think, very, very, very uh, important. So that uh, there's a different fields. There's a cyber command. Uh, we have uh, actually there's a cyber defense league part. Exactly. Uh, yeah. There's our intelligence services who have teams. Where I'm, uh, yeah, my background is left as well. So I'm I'm smiling that uh, those teams can do the things they can never do in a private life, actually, so uh, yeah. without being sentenced. <laughs> and uh, and one other question, because still it seems that people are a bit shy, you know, it takes a bit of time for the questions uh, from my side. So very recently, I think it was one and a half months, two months ago, Estonia for the first time ever publicly attributed uh, an attack from the Chiru uh, to, you know, to Chiru. <laughs> uh, the attack happened in 2020, uh, so it took around four years for the investigation and everything. Why do you think this is important as well? And in terms of especially for the educational perspective, what have we learned from these processes uh, for, when it comes to the attribution? And, and you have been an ambassador and like in, in terms of also uh, for the diplomatic, the cyber diplomacy side, uh, why, why this is so essential so that we actually publicly say and point the fingers? Well, the I think we need to call the spade the spade, uh, call the things w with the right names. And we know who our enemy is, so we, we shouldn't be uh, too polite uh, saying that, yeah, we were attacked by, uh, I, well, I don't know, we, by whom. We know by whom, then let's, let's call it out, actually. So uh, that, that in case of yeah, coming from diplomacy, I have quite several times said that diplomacy is not about protocol or, or being uh, over the edge polite. It's about uh, skills to convince someone mm -hmm. in something. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we want to say that, hey, we are on a directed attacks from Russia, we call it out. Yeah, and besides this, again, when we see the patterns there, there is something that we can learn and again prepare ourselves for the for the next attacks to kind of prevent as well. That's the cooperation yeah. part, because yeah. they are using the tools against us. What they tomorrow use against Sweden or day after that against Latvia. If we are not uh, cooperating and 
sharing uh, our lessons identified. Uh, we are never reaching the lessons learned. So uh, let's do cooperation. So we actually have received now questions also from the from the audience. I, I, I told you it takes a bit of time. Uh, but there is already four questions. So I'm, uh, as we have around four minutes, I'm going to take two of them over here. So what's your opinion regarding Ukraine's volunteer cyber army uh, by the locals who, together with the government entities, are carrying out cyber attacks against Russia? Should we attack back? Uh, as I said, I, I have... Uh, in, maybe not invented, but I'm using the term proactive defense. Well, like that. <laughs> which is uh, <coughs> which is basically we are attacking back yeah. because uh, active defense is the most uh, well uh, efficient way. It's uh, you need to with, with the same as with missiles. Don't uh, take down the arrow. Take down the archer. So take down where the attacks are coming, actually. Yeah, and we have seen also in terms of like again raising the awareness side there as well for the Russian-like population that uh, Ukrainian also you know voluntarily have attacked their uh, TV channels so that to actually show the real pictures what's happening in the fields there as well. I've been in yeah. Ukraine during the large-scale war. Yeah. There was only one channel because they merged everything it else into done. one uh, information channel. So yeah, well. That's, uh, that's the life for Russians as well. Yeah. need to be. And there is an question also very much related to this, and I understand why people are, are especially focusing on these topics. So what was the most surprising move by the Russians in the first days of Russian scale, uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine? I, I, if you can somehow kind of uh, relate this to cyber as well, because I do know that yeah, they, yeah, well, they first tried yeah, yeah. to attack uh, Ukraine in cyberspace. It failed, and then we saw some additional steps happen. I think that was the most surprising thing, that uh, the communication mm. survived. And uh, the internet, or the well, yeah, internet survived, actually. The... The mobile uh, connection survived, actually. All those uh, apps we used to communicate between each other because we had agreed, basically, that if there will be a blackout and we cannot send messages via different uh, apps between each other, where shall we go and how shall we do? It survived for a very short period, so maybe one hour bit more sometimes the internet was gone but uh, you managed to take it through the mobile internet and well that was Surprising. maybe really a biggest surprise because uh, I was convinced that Ukrainians are good soldiers mm -hmm. they will fight back uh, it will not fall in three days or three weeks but yeah that the communication channels remained uh, functioning mm -hmm. that was a surprise so nation of engineers uh, mm. <laughs> beyond uh, being of fighters as well actually that didn't surprise me but yeah this one kind of like a prevention methods as well i'm thinking the last question as well because i really do like that one as well um but how do we mitigate the knowledge and generational cap uh, between two who recruit now into cyber defense versus the generation of officers who we expect to lead them i think that's a, that's a very good one as well in terms of again Let's uh, put them together in the same room. I think. Do you think they will the, understand the, each other? The, the age is not, uh, I think, so much. Uh, uh, how to say, uh, showstopper? Because uh, my my mom started to do the e-voting before me. Okay. So so well, I think uh, just put them together, give them a task. Uh, let uh, let them learn from each other. Let them <laughs> learn from each other. You're absolutely right. All right. Uh, I'm not going to keep you here on the stage no, no longer, but uh, let's uh, do a round of applause uh, to Kaimo uh, for his keynote and, and also the, the answer. So thank you very much, Kaimo. <laughs> <coughs> And uh, now we will continue to talk about the educational topics as well, because the Ministry of Education also plays a massive, massive role in terms of raising the cyber, you know, uh, skilled people. And, and, and for that, I'm very, very happy to ask uh, on a stage Renno Weintal, uh, who is the Deputy Secretary General of Higher Education, Research and Adult Education at the Ministry of Education and Research, so many words of education. But the stage is yours and, uh, and uh, yeah, excited to hear from you. Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning, everybody, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great, great privilege for me to be here. Uh, within the next 15 minutes, I will try to cover the most important challenges and, and also the opportunities we see on a ministry level in order to um, address these challenges. I have been with the ministry for three years. Before that, I, I served as a professor in, a, in a, one of our universities. Uh, what I have learned within these three years is that everything starts from the education. Whatever problem there is in, in the society, the policymakers, politicians, other stakeholders come together, uh, argue, disagree, but what they always agree uh, on is that uh, we should do something with the education. So there is, uh, what, uh, I recognize the, the uh, responsibility and, uh, and uh, uh, we have, but, um, but uh, at the same time, um, I see this as opportunity because uh, everybody uh, wants to contribute uh, to improve the educational system. Now, I will start with, uh, with uh, la labor, labor force, labor sh shortage skills. In Estonia, we uh, have developed a coordination system or prognosis system, which uh, is not entirely unique, uh, but it's uh, quite efficient uh, and it's a reliable tool, so we can know what do we need. Um, there is a paradox that if we count together all these domains where there is a skill shortage or labor so shortage, we would find that in Estonia we are missing something in between 50 to 70,000 skilled people. So that's another issue which uh, we cannot uh, somehow solve here. But uh, I'm just uh, uh, presenting the data on the uh, uh, skill skills shortage or the, the, um, the um, prognosis on IT, uh, number of IT specialists we, we believe we need in Estonia. The prognosis has been quite, uh, uh, quite precise. The yellow line uh, is, uh, uh, visualizes the, the forecast uh, until 2027. The blue bars actually uh, show um, the uh, employment indicators. Uh, so we see uh, this demand to, uh, uh, to uh, that it's growing, um, and um, um, uh, it's quite logical. Uh, but I, I just like to mention that it's getting harder and harder to to um, uh, to distinguish whether it's it's uh, an IT specialist or a, or a specialist of another field, because it 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 has been also changing. As an example, I would like to uh, tell a story when when I was preparing uh, as an engineer. And then later, when I was, uh, was uh, serving as a professor in mechanical engineering, I clearly recognized how much or how, how fast the, the, uh, the content of education uh, is changing. And that makes, uh, makes um, that creates many, many difficulties within these discussions, because there are many people who would, who would um, argue that we, we we, we need more this, we, we, we would need more that, new, new skills, new competences, but on the other hand, refuse to let go some other, which uh, uh, have become somehow obsolete or irrelevant. So that's the, that's the uh, challenge of, uh, of the educator to identify the, 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 the true true need of, uh, of, of this new stuff which is, is, is required. So um, uh, the, uh, the challenges we have in, in ICT, uh, they, they uh, appear from the uh, OSCA prognosis the, the, uh, and, and uh, I'd like to emphasize that um, there is a growing need for, for specialists with advanced technological skills. Industries across all sectors uh, 
are, uh, are seeing workers capable of handling intelligent work and, and uh, digital transformation. Then the other, uh, other uh, statement is that, uh, that, the, um, that there is a uh, shortage in skills related to data processing and cybersecurity, which is the main topic of, of today's conference. So that's a subdomain of, of this IT specialist, which, uh, uh, which has to be addressed uh, uh, as a part of, of this um, Mm, question. And then the, it was referred earlier today already uh, that, that Estonia stands fairly well in, in PISA. So um, that's, that's correct. But, but again, we need, to, um, we need to make sure that our children are not going to use the digital devices only for, for, uh, to, for entertainment or mainly for entertainment, but actually would, would uh, uh, start to use them more to, to develop the, uh, the, these digital skills. Now, uh, it, it appears that somehow the, the, uh, um, the, the society has um, acknowledged the, the demand for, for ICT specialists and uh, the response has been, in some extent, uh, not in favor of other disciplines. So there is a pool of people who would specialize on technical uh, subjects. And if uh, the, there is a high demand on ICT, we see that, that other uh, domains may be suffering. So the challenge on the level of policymaker is how to make it more appealing to, to more people, as it's by constitution, the, the choice in education is entirely free. And so... Uh, uh, in order to address this, there are many new outreach activities being being launched, and uh, on 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 various levels of, of education. It's it's as you see, it, it's it's a pyramid, or as you know, it's a pyramid, and and uh, there are no way that we can uh, somehow uh, effectively uh, improve the the uh, the. Uh, higher education unless we, we um, keep uh, or on if there is expectation that there should be a structural change in higher education that it has to be uh, uh, it has to be uh, made possible on already on a general education because many choices uh, done are done on on the level of of uh, of uh, general education, and uh, in Estonia we we have identified uh, that that uh, the vocational education uh, needs very special attention, and uh, and uh, that that has become a new priority for us. Now, as as the uh, the time for uh, for me is is fairly limited, uh, I'd like to. Uh, brief, uh, briefly cover also the, the research and development, uh, which, uh, which uh, is, um, uh, is another part of our responsibility. And um, now I will skip some of the, the uh, some of the uh, information I, I was intending to, to share on on the um, youth programs. But uh, and uh, go directly to to uh, specific IT uh, programs. We have had very successful experience with with uh, what we call IT Academy, a specific designated program to improve the ca or to raise the awareness to to uh, improve the capacity in our universities, uh, and and uh, this has been truly successful the the number of uh, uh, high level uh, researchers educators has been increasing uh, the the output is is uh, of 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 this new workforce or, or, or the uh, research stuff is is exceptional, and based on this experience, we intend to continue also for the next uh, uh, seven years this program and actually extend it to other domains, uh, by large to to engineering disciplines. So to 
the specific aspect of this IT academy has been that it's a very much driven by the co uh, entre entrepreneurs, the, the, um, the st stakeholders who specify what is the specific expectation uh, to, um, to educational sector. Uh, and, uh, and as the education stands on the foundation of, of research and development, we, uh, we use the uh, we use our uh, compactness, as was referred to before, uh, for our advantage as, and, and uh, focus on some very specific uh, domains. Uh, this is not only about ICT, of course, there are some other fields which we consider as priority areas. However, the digitalization uh, horizontally uh, throughout other industries is, is uh, uh, a stone and priority. And as you can see, the cybersecurity as a specific domain in this priority area is listed. Is listed, and we have allocated significant resources to to um, to develop that uh, that part of uh, of research. A number of initiatives, uh, uh, the um, the thematic programs, uh, mostly relying on on the uh, on the uh, uh, structure of funds, which still support the Estonian uh, Estonian. Um, uh, uh, Estonia, uh, and this will be the, uh, the last period, I believe, where we can rely on European funds. And, uh, and one of these, um, these uh, funds is uh, thematic R&D programs, which, which then uh, massively support uh, uh, ICT, uh, among other, other priority areas. Uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, specific topics developed in our universities will continue. Uh, this program is going to continue. There are three programs in, in our two major uh, universities, University of Tartu and uh, Taltec, the Technical University in Estonia. And the seventh topic is, is uh, digital transformation through lifelong learning, which is in, in Tallinn University. Now uh, I see my, my time is is up. Uh, there are there are so many topics to cover in uh, in in research. The last and final thing I'd like to mention is our collaboration with with our Nordic uh, uh, Nordic par uh, partners, or actually. Uh, I'm referring to the fastest supercomputer in Europe, uh, where Estonia is the co-host, the LUMI initiative, which is a, a fantastic opportunity for everybody doing uh, research, not only in ICT, but here the ICT, uh, or this is a platform, it's a tool, and we expect uh, this to be also a vehicle for this collaboration. Uh, between the Estonian researchers and, and uh, their Nordic peers. Thank you so much for having me on stage uh, uh, and uh, happy to answer all the questions you, you may have. Yes, applause time. Um, thank you very much, Svenno, and, and, and for the overview and everything. And, and once again, uh, we're going to have now the, the Slido uh, numbers here in the background in a second so that you can also ask your questions. We already have one question as well. Uh, a bit of uh, more because you focused a lot about like what Estonia is doing, but I do know that also, you know, we work with a lot of EU countries as well. Um, by the statistics, so uh, 12 countries out of 27 in Europe uh, provide cyber as part of their curriculum. Uh, is there any kind of EU initiative to actually change that? Or do we have any power or is Estonia somehow also a bit forcing the other EU countries to think about that? Uh, great question. It's right now the time when, when the design of the next fr framework uh, program is... Uh, is it, is happening. Actually, the, the, there are plans made how to continue for the next framework pro program, uh, and it's a, it's a massive uh, re resource by one hand, and, and uh, on the other hand, it's, it's, a, 
it's um, it's a challenge now to agree between all the countries. And of course, the, as the cyber uh, has become the priority in, in many ways, the, the, there should be a response in this uh, uh, next framework uh, program. But I can't really say that it's going to be like that because still it's, it's a conceptual phase. There are many reports being given to, in order to establish uh, the, the landscape. But, but uh, to my understanding, there is a quite significant consensus that that should be a, uh, a part of that program. Mm -hmm. um, so we also have some of the educators, like also some of the teachers in the room as well. I remember the time when I was younger and I was kind of working uh, to get entrepreneurship course as, as part of or sort of like a curriculum in a school. And there were a lot of responses as well that we got was like, no, we cannot take out mathematics. We have already too much job. Like we don't have enough, you know, time or uh, even uh, placed in, in our kind of school. Um, uh, I mean, also the calendar and everything to, to have these courses. Do you see that this is also still one of the problems that there is also a lot of kind of uh, resistance to this as well, saying that, you know, we cannot change that. Uh, we need also these classes that are very, very important as well. Uh. Well, you hit the nail. Uh, absolutely correct. The the education as such is uh, quite traditional. I see that the, the, there is a quite a significant demand from from outside to ch uh, for a change. But given that the, 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 it's quite institutionalized, there are so many. Uh, uh, people involved, then it's quite understandable that it, it has certain inertia. So you can't, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an excuse, but it's more about how, how what is the governing model for institutions? Where, uh, how do we choose the leaders? Because it, it, uh, it very much dep depends on the, on the leaders. And if the leaders ha have been immersed into, into this culture, then the change is possible. Of course, the, the changing programs is, is, has been always possible, but, but now we are seeing that the, the, uh, the cycles are getting shorter. And so that, that puts uh, enormous pressure on the, on the system. There are, uh, and and it's, not, it's not easy at all. So making choices, and, and we are not, uh, it's not the, about, you know, looking in, in a mirror and, and thinking back, what, what did we need yesterday? It's more of, of seeing what is, what is in the future. Yeah. And at the end of the day as well, like actually cyber is not even a separate domain in education, but should be included into a lot of different kind of also fields of Absolutely. education as well. But we are uh, out of time. Um, so uh, once again, a big applause to, uh, to also to uh, Renno uh, for his uh, overview about what's happening here in Estonia. Uh, so if you can uh, join for an applause. And uh, yeah, very big thank, thank you. you. And um, now uh, we are actually moving from the Estonian experience all the way to Sweden. Uh, so from campus to boot camp, uh, extramural education in cybersecurity. And I'm happy to ask on the stage Gunnar Garson, who is the professor at the Cyber Campus Sweden uh, and then also the KTH uh, Royal Institute of Technology. So happy to hear about what Sweden is up to as well. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here to share with you experiences of taking university education outside the campus. Um, Cyber Campus Sweden, which I'm representing, is a new organization to bring together the public sector, the private sector, and the civic society for uh, research, innovation, and education. And I'm leading the education effort here. So uh, the background is that we are, since five years back, training uh, soldiers for uh, the Swedish Armed Forces in cybersecurity. We, they're called cyber soldiers. And they're conscript soldiers, typically of uh, 19, 20 years of age, coming directly from high school. You can serve as a volunteer in Sweden until you're 40, but most of come directly. And in this context, we're providing education from KTH, my home university, uh, for the cybersecurity contents of this, this uh, office. Uh, since this is military training, we do not have faculty on site. Uh, so how do we do the training if we cannot be there lecturing and, and bringing about the education? Also, since uh, the conscripts are vetted by a state agency, we have no insight in how they're selected, what backgrounds they have. They, might not have any uh, technical or uh, natural science background. They could come from social sciences or, or um, other fields. 
And also, when we started to develop this, it was not clear who would be the officers at the Swedish Armed Forces, what training they would have. Could they assume the role of being uh, professors or teachers for, for this uh, program, or how should we approach it? So uh, the conclusion I made was that uh, we cannot design in resources that we cannot guarantee, meaning uh, uh, well-educated uh, teachers in, in the subject areas and uh, a known background for the students. So uh, the format that we decided to, to have is for independent study, and I will show you what that means. So the boot camp training, as we call it, uh, is uh, that you focus on essentials. So everything that this is not necessary to, to meet goals is stripped away from the, uh, from the program. And you design the program to, to meet particular goals. A very important part, which works very well in the the uh, military service, but may not work so well on a campus, is that you set aside work time, not only lecture time, but actually the work time. And you provide a workspace, even if it turns out to be out in the, in the sticks, in the forests like, like this. So in this setting, we're teaching four regular KTH courses, two in basic IT, on networking and computer systems, and two in, in cybersecurity. The first two courses are undergraduate, taught in uh, engineering programs uh, in the first three years, and the other two courses are graduate courses taught in, in year four and five of the, of the master's thesis pro uh, programs. Master's program, sorry. Uh, they are regular courses, and they also give academic credits. So uh, the, the conscript soldiers graduate of the year, and they have 15 credits of undergraduate training, and they have 15 credits of master's level training when they are 20 year old or 21 year old when they get out. So uh, the way we designed it is that they have local instructors by the Swedish Armed Forces, and uh, they are typically serving two years, and then they go back to their, their home base, and new service coming in. So we have not designed in any critical teaching capacity in this. And all the contents, all the examination and support for the instructors is done from the university, but we do not need to be on site for, for, for the training. So this is the format that I believe we should take outside uh, the university also for training other categories in society, professionals typically, because the skills gap cannot only be met by training young people into the profession. We also need to train people who are already working, and that's my, the main focus of Cyber Campus Sweden. So this format requires that it's challenge-driven with clear tasks, clear resources that are necessary to, to solve the task, but maybe not more than that, and high expectations. So here's an example from the computer systems course where the students in, in the first project design all the, the circuits they need to build a computer. So they're given a simple uh, building block called a NAND gate, and, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and they build as, as the final chip in this project the arithmetic and logical unit of a computer, which is a quite advanced chip. And that's one project. So the work is highly intensive. There are no competing coursework, as it usually is on a university campus, and as I said, scheduled work time, which is a key ingredient for this. And another most important point is that the students organize the work. They never work alone. They work in groups, or at, at least in, in pairs. But all the examination is done individually, but the learning goes on together, and they support one another, so they're not so dependent on having teachers on site. So that's the background for, from the training of, of, uh, uh, for the Swedish Armed Forces. So what are we doing now in Cyber Campus Sweden? Well, we want to target professionals and in all groups where cyber security is, is necessary. In healthcare, maybe you need to be a nurse to understand healthcare and learn to know enough cyber security to work with those problems in the healthcare sector. And you have that in retail, finance, a lot of areas, all areas basically in society are touched by cyber security and you need to have the domain knowledge in order to, to work in those areas. So uh, these are the target groups, and to meet those target groups, we need to be flexible in formats. University training is usually not flexible in format because we have the students on campus full time. And here we have professionals who are working at the same time as the training, so we, we need to, to adapt to their uh, needs and, and, and availability. 
And we do that in collaboration. So this is what CyberCampus is all about, that we are working with university, vocational training institutions, uh, commercial uh, educators, and also local study centers where you can have the training. A format to do this outside the, the military context or outside the campus is to work in study circles. This is a format uh, pioneered by, by, by the, the pastor Grundtvig in Denmark and has been used in training in the, all the Nordic countries where, where people come together to study together and support one another. So this can be done in many places in society because individual study at home is not necessarily very successful. It's better when you work together with others. And this can be done at the local study centers that are exist throughout the Nordics in, in communities, in libraries, there are group rooms you can book, in workplaces and other, where you can bring a group together. So from the university, it means that we have to provide structured material so that the study circle can orient itself without getting lost. Here's an example again from the computer systems course, where you see that all the projects have sim same structure, preparation, a project, and a discussion of the, of the work. And that's, that's the whole structure of, of the whole course. Uh, all projects have the same structure. And that's to make it easy to orient and, and, and work independently of any teacher. Uh, the university role is, of course, to, to provide the courses in this format and also to team up uh, people who register for a course from various sites. They may not know one another, but they live in the same town or, or village and they could come together to form a study circle around the material if they simply get to, to introduce to one another. And, of course, the university provides the examination for this. So, what is the summary for this? Our learnings. Uh, first of all, we have to acknowledge that we're designing education for human beings. Sometimes we put too high expectations on, uh, on people, say, oh, we provide an online course, you can take it whenever you want. Um, it doesn't necessarily get priority in, in professional people's lives, where the, where the job is demanding, their family, and other things that, that are, are calling for their attention. So we have to be clear on, on it's possible for people to complete it. Uh, the, the attrition rate in, in online education where people study alone is very, very high. Um, 20 to 30 percent complete the courses, but most of them actually drop out. So, so, um, and we have to recognize that many of these important topics are hard to learn, because otherwise everyone would know them already. Um, and it takes time to learn something important also. This is something also to be recognized by employees employers who need to allow people to set aside work time to work on, on, on a skill that you require. So there are many learnings there to take away. So what I mentioned is that you need to have, from a university side, you need to have a very clear structure that people can spend useful time with get, getting lost. Collaboration and peer support is very important. And uh, uh, active learning where very clear challenge tasks is necessary to, 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 to make this a good format. And uh, for the university, it means to provide education where the content might be readily available, but the format is what needs to be transformed in order to take courses from campus to boot camp and study circles. Thank you very much. so much and then again a great kind of uh, an overview of what you have been doing in Sweden and, and and I especially really really love like how many sectors you have included there again showing that cyber again is not a different domain but really really influences to life and, and security in each kind of different uh, sector as well. Uh, so once again uh, you should be able to see now the QR codes it's your time to also ask questions. Uh, I, I would take the first one uh, over here as well that we already had received before. So how many people can you actually Accept per year, each year to the boot camp. Like how many? How many kind of? Uh, you, if you just try to put it to the, into the numbers as well. Uh, the way we designed it is that the. the uh the, the critical resource from university teaching is, is the, the university teacher time. Mm -hmm. so, so we designed it to minimize that. Okay. So we're currently training uh, 60 conscript soldiers for the Swedish Armed okay. Forces. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are not the bottleneck uh, in increasing that number. So, uh, so I think uh, for an individual course, maybe a teacher could handle, with, with some teaching assistance from university, uh, several hundred. I, I don't think that, that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. It's also the, the logistics of arranging the group and so forth and, and following them that, that takes, uh, but that doesn't require uh, very skilled teachers necessarily. Okay, um, so we are going to talk about also very largely and in, in the next also panel discussions here about the AI mm. 
Mm-hmm. Do you also see that there is a much, much more bigger role of new kind of also technologies that can help us to kind of uh, um, work with the entire skill gap and also in the teachers? Because like we too lack also teachers that are, you know, educating the future, uh, the, the future stars and in cybersecurity. Mm. Uh, do you think and, and what has been the analysis also from the Swedish side? Uh, and, and are people open for this in terms of also education regarding AI? I, I think this is a, a big discussion topic still. It has not settled yet. We have to recognize that AI is great for learning. Um, AI is also great for not learning. And this dichotomy is, is, is the, the, why there's so much discussion. Uh, students uh, that delegate the task to an AI instead of writing the essay themselves and things like that. So we have to find the formats where AI supports learning and, uh, and uh, trying to, to uh, um, handle the cases where it's, it, where it's not used. But I think for, for, as a learning technology, I think it's, it's very good for for challenging students and, and tailoring so they drill down on the things that they do not master uh, while, while skipping over things that they already learned. Yeah, so just finding the balance somewhere there that yep. you know it provides Certainly. us support, but at the same time that we still would have the brains that we also use. Yeah, for, yeah, for yeah recognizing that. that. Well. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, but, uh, but mm-hmm. thank you very much, mm-hmm. and, and, and let's do again another round of applause to Gunnar here. Um, so I will I will let you to, to leave the stage over here, and we're going to uh, take actually one step a bit closer to Estonia. So we're stepping to to Finland, uh, which is uh, just around the corner here. So I'm I'm, I'm very 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 glad that we have actually Maria Baku. Uh, I don't know if I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, and uh, she's the CEO at CyberGoach and, and uh, she's going to talk about the case CyberGoach avoiding harm with AI in security education. So exactly what we just, uh, what we just discussed, but much more in detail. So Maria, the stage is yours. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Beek, and yeah, I will be talking about uh, Case Cyber Coach and how we avoid harm in AI and security education. So I'm always the one, it seems, at these conferences drawing all the devils on the wall and what could go wrong, and that's kind of what I'm going to do do here today. I'm following uh, quite impressive names here, so I thought I'd a little bit introduce myself. There are a lot of people today talking about AI. Who am I to talk about AI? Well, 15 years ago, I was actually... Uh, well, today I'm, my day job is the CEO. Uh, I'm the CEO at CyberCoach, and p- as part of that, uh, for the past five years, I've been trying to figure out how we can leverage these new technologies, how we can use technologies like AI um, to learn, uh, teach people, but also um, how how people learn the necessary security privacy skills around that and that algorithmic literacy at scale so that they can survive in a society that's based on algorithms. But before that, I spent nearly a decade uh, working with data privacy and cybersecurity across finance, across healthcare, and uh, altogether, I guess, 15 years now uh, working with sensitive personal data. You can see a little kid, poor kid with electrodes on their head. Um, that was me as a researcher in a room 15 years ago trying to build algorithms for analyzing the brain activity of these poor, poor children with screens that look like that. So technology has advanced a lot. Back, uh, back in the days, I was apparently skilled enough to design algorithms for (laughs) studying very sensitive medical data of small children, but I wasn't receiving any cyber education. So the world has profoundly changed in the last last 15 years. Uh, I managed to uh, graduate as a licentiate in bioinformatics, but now more shifted into cybersecurity, uh, now pursuing my doctoral thesis at the Aldo University in Finland, uh, set to graduate in in 26. Uh, Happy to connect with anyone there, uh, here in the room, so my connection details are there. So when I, when I talk about harm in AI, uh, I want to illustrate what I'm ta- going to talk about. Uh, the timer, by the way, isn't working here, but I'll try to be, be concise. Uh, so one, one case, just one way we are using AI already today in the cybersecurity defense side, so in our corporate security teams. So what are we already doing? That's kind of wrong. <laughs> We are using AI today to target personalized email phishing campaigns at employees and these kinds of continuous phishing uh, email tests to employees and to see if they are susceptible to these attacks. Based on how they perform in these uh, simulations, we actually use AI to personalize and target content to them and remediation to those employees that actually fail these tests. And finally, We're using AI again to risk score all these employees and potentially restrict the use, the access they have on their devices for those employees that we deem high risk. 
So this is what it looks like. We're using hyper-realistic, and these are marketing, uh, marketing um, uh, little excerpts of marketing of, of different kinds of companies that are already providing these services. So we're using hyper-realistic, scarily personalized attack simulations, where in just a few clicks, you know, you can show that you either know this stuff or you don't know this stuff. And what does that lead us to? The security team will see all these alerts. So Jack here has compromised his account. <laughs> Some lady ignored the email and somebody opened it. So you get all this kind of metrics in real time of what are these employees doing? We have all the, these data points entering. So we're trying to catch risky employee behaviors right as they happen. So continuous monitoring of employees. And then we have these workflows around that. And we have these intricate dashboards of all these different people. And what is their impact in the organization? What is their risk score? We're traffic lighting them. Who are our red, high risk employees? Who are a little bit less risk in yellow? And who are green? So this is already today. This is what we're doing as security teams under the guise of protecting enterprises uh, from cyber threats. And up to the point of even profile building, so actually studying the vulnerabilities of individuals. So we're going to say that Maria, uh, she's obedient, 15%. <laughs> and she is somebody who watches a lot of sports online, so maybe we're ta targeting her with a Viaplay campaign. She uses the Viaplay app. Uh, it's getting really quite invasive. And the reason I worry about this, the reason I go around uh, these conferences talking about this, is that already nine years ago, our technology was at the point where just 300 data points on an individual could tell us more about that individual than their spouse. My spouse might actually be in this room, <laughs> so I don't know, does this tell us more about you know, marital relations or <laughs> the state of algorithms? But regardless, that's, that's kind of scary. We Already nine years ago, we didn't need much data in order to build these comprehensive profiles about individuals. So we're far, far along in that, that today. So what is, that, what is the harm in this exactly, of doing this at scale, this kind of surveillance, monitoring, and risk po profile of, profiling of employees in the workplace at scale? Well, on one hand, uh, the AI profiling and the targeting can be scarily accurate. And we're needing less and less data points to do that. So that's, that's scary because if we can use it for good, attackers can use it for bad. <laughs> so we're effectively putting targets on employees' backs uh, in the, under the guise of protecting the enterprise. But then it can also be scarily inaccurate. So it can lead to unjust treatment of individuals. It can lead to very biased decision-making. It wasn't long ago that I was actually at a security conference where they were trying to say that young women are the most likely clickers, <laughs> and that has nothing to do. That's not grounded in any sort of scientific reality. Uh, just to remind you guys of where we are today with, uh, with the technology, I've just spent several weeks really studying the EU AI Act, and I asked a few test questions from ChatGPT, like how are we doing, what, what, how does ChatGPT understand the AI Act, and it hallucinated the fines. It couldn't even get the fine percentages right. <laughs> so we're using technology that is at this level to target hyper-personalized attacks at employees to risk profile employees in the workplace and in ways that will affect their employment. So that's, that's kind of a scary reality. And if we think of that's the situation today, um, what are we exposing the kids of today in the future? I mean, this is just the development we've seen the last 10, 15 years. What, what does the next 10, 15 years look like? If we're gathering this data set now today, how can that be used and abused 15 years down the road? I don't know. Can it be avoided? Um, that's kind of what I hope to hope to talk to you guys today. I think so. Yes, uh, I wouldn't be in cybersecurity if I wasn't inherently optimistic that there was a world to be saved, <laughs> that there was a, something to save, uh, something to gain here. And I think it can be saved through regulation. Obviously, the AI Act being one one great step towards that, prohibiting some some use cases. It can be saved through education. The more people know, the more they can control. Uh, the more they can actually affect um, their their privacy and their rights. And through different kinds of anonymous solutions and data minimization. So taking kind of a step back and thinking, do we need all this data? What is the actual goal we need to accomplish? Do we need to monitor employees this invasively? Is there an alternative? And I, I really want to believe that we do have an alternative. That's what my day job is all about. So for the past soon six years, we've been building CyberCoach. CyberCoach is the first anonymous and psychologically safe uh, security awareness training platform. So we do none of that invasive AI targeting, monitoring, or profiling of employees. We actually enable them to learn in a, psychologi a psychologically safe, anonymous environment. What it looks like, um, 
you can choose tones, so you can kind of have these personalizations, but have them anonymously, uh, have these kind of fun, engaging, old school text-based games where you start a training, you make decisions, and then things unfold. So the scenario unfolds, and then you learn in kind of a very safe environment, all kinds of attack scenarios and everything that can, can happen in, in real life. And then you collect, collect badges for that. Uh, we offer these role-based, so we have highly technical content as well, uh, content for leadership, uh, content for factory floor, you name it, we got it. So we believe that there's a whole world out there of security skills that people need. It's not just about not clicking a link or having a good password anymore, that's not enough. We need to go far beyond that in the security education space and the corporate education space. And that's something that we're trying to, trying to do with CyberCoach. And I think my key takeaway today for the audience here and everybody making decisions around how we use AI in education is that let's try to remember that not everything is an AI. <laughs> we have this great opportunity. There are lots of great things we can do around AI. But there are some things that we don't need to do, use AI for. And I, I'm a big believer in this kind of simple, simple uh, motto that you know, we can use the dumbest possible solution <laughs> for the problem that we're trying to solve. Because uh, then we can at least understand it and maybe minimize some of the harm you know, 10, 15 years down the line. It doesn't need to be super complicated. But thank you, everyone. Looking forward to continuing the discussion. Please get in touch. <laughs> Awesome. And I really, really do love when somebody comes on a stage with such kind of energy and being very optimistic. And we actually already received one question also about like being optimistic about in cybersecurity. And once again, you can ask your questions and please be active because, you know, you, you will get your answers here on the stage. Uh, so you said that you're very op optimistic about, again, the AI use in cybersecurity and so on. Is there anything, if you could admit that side, that you're also very afraid of in the field of cybersecurity? A lot. <laughs> and what are you afraid of? Uh, I think it's mostly this kind of, uh, the more power we're giving to AI in terms of scoring, assessing, profiling, the more automation we're trying to do with that. Because what I'm seeing is that, like, although we've kind of made technological Im improvements and efficiency improvements with AI, we haven't really made any major improvements in terms of the hallucinations and the accuracy of the technology. And as, like, looking back at my engineering and mathematics background and the research that we're currently seeing in this space, I don't know if we're going to see that in the coming years. Mm -hmm. But we are more and more widely using AI at the same time. So that's that's something that I'm very concerned about, that do the people that use AI have the necessary skills mm -hmm. uh, to evaluate what the AI is in, inputting. And especially when we're thinking of learning, I think that's really important because when you're learning something, by definition, you're not the expert <laughs> in what you're learning. So so learning from AI, you need to kind of a bit be. So so finding those use cases, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, so I always love to ask a question when be, uh, people talk about like also AI and cybersecurity. If I would put the scale here, and this is opportunities, and here is uh, the side of threats, where would you put AI? Threats and opportunities. <laughs> right now, to be honest, I'm seeing a lot more threats yeah. than opportunities. And how uh, we can move to the direction yeah, exactly. of the exactly. I, I think there are clear ways we can move towards the opportunity side. Uh, we just need to expand the conversation around uh, around the potential harm, and that's that's really going to be. And do you think also that in terms of all the regulations and everything, because like in terms of like the EU and its regulations, and you brought it up also the EU AI Act as well, and these two uh, as as well that is regulating a lot of things also for this, especially for the cybersecurity sense of view as well. Um, do you think that these things are again necessary in terms of like you know finding that? good kind of a bliss point there as well. Absolutely. And with education, everybody knows that we're really short on resources everywhere. So it's really easy to build this business case and this opportunity around using AI. The challenge is that are we going to come up with these rules yeah. <laughs> and to make it safe enough, fast enough, because we're going to need it. We have the skill gap we're talking about today. And, and it's there's no question that we're going to need this technology to solve these problems. It's just that we really need to spend time figuring this out and thinking this through. All right. We'll continue the discussion with you uh, later and yep. also in a panel. But uh, once again, a very big thank you to Maria. And as I said, we came from Sweden to Finland, and now we have a right back to uh, Estonia. Uh, so I'm very, very uh, happy to also ask Oleg uh, Tsaikovsky, uh, who is the head of Ministry of uh, Education and Research Working Group on AI and Education in Estonia. And he is going to talk about the future trends uh, in secure AI-supported education. So Oleg, the stage is yours.
Thank you so much, Annette. Uh, it's, um, you know, there are so many great ideas already formulated here. So uh, it's, um, thank you, Gunnar, Sarkio, uh, Maria for that. Uh, it's uh, pretty easy to start to build up from here. Uh, and um, and uh, let me maybe start from, uh, I mean, we all know that uh, education is uh, an extremely conservative area. And it should be. So no doubts here, it should be a very uh, conservative area. So, uh, but um, what I truly believe in is that AI today in this extremely conservative area is the single biggest game changer for centuries. Let me repeat that. So AI is the single biggest game chair for, for centuries. So I think that the only one what is a little bit maybe comparable with that was say 200, 250 years ago, where all the notion of encyclopedias start to raise up and they changed our understanding about what exactly education has to be, so what we have to focus on. But, uh, but today we have a lot of positive uh, we have a lot of positive uh, promises and, uh, and expectations towards AI. So just try to imagine, for instance, the 24-7 available, uh, I would say, uh, in um, uh, absolutely indefinitely patient uh, uh, teacher assistant what is available for kids 24-7. And I'm stressing here the word of uh, assistant because, uh, because I truly believe in the notion that the teacher will not be replaced by AI. So in overall, kind of in this dilemma of uh, uh, person versus machine, so I rather believe that there is no dilemma person versus machine. I rather believe to the dilemma that, that quite uh, in a closest future, the persons who are able to use the machines on the right way, they will have enormous advantages, advantages over the persons who don't uh, know how to use machines properly. And it comes not only to the teachers, so it comes to whatever areas we can imagine, doctors, lawyers, I mean, lawyer who can use properly, even chat GPT, the easiest one maybe, uh, is uh, in times more efficient than lawyer can, who cannot use that uh, tools, right? So uh, just try to imagine that we have teacher assistant who is able to be 24 seven available for students, <laughs> helping them to, uh, to cover certain curriculums. So again, it's not instead of teachers, it's rather in addition to teachers, available 24-7. Or for instance, just try to imagine this absolutely unprecedented level and capacity of analytics what we have today. So, uh, or uh, for instance, the way how we can, I mean, if we combine just two previous two points, so it can lead us to the uh, notion of the uh, personalized learning path. By the way, Estonia is already today pretty advanced in that and moving uh, forward with that. So uh, creating this personalized, uh, or say, preparing the way for, uh, for moving this personalized uh, learning path for students. So where you can try to understand where are the gaps in previous uh, knowledges of persons, meaning that, I mean, even if you see the, uh, student who has uh, who has already has uh, challenges with uh, tackling the uh, the ohm uh, law for example in physics then you can understand that actually it's not about the ohm law but there are some kind of mathematics uh, challenges what appeared 2 3 years ago so you can understand where exactly these challenges are there but in this same situation, we have a lot of challenges, right? So uh, we have challenges for teachers. Uh, for instance, uh, we, uh, we need to deal with education. I've seen as a practitioner teacher, I've seen a lot of examples of teachers who has just tried a little bit, just tried this water of, uh, for example, chat GPT, did it slightly on the wrong way, didn't got the expected results. And as a result of that, they are saying that they start to keep saying that, I mean, it's everything, it doesn't work. You know? So uh, there is no sense in that, so uh, it doesn't work at all. So we have to, to educate the teachers. We have to educate the teacher about the, I mean, the old notion of cyber awareness uh, with regards to that, because there are certain kind of cyber sec, uh, um, cyber sec threats uh, around uh, all this notion of AI. For example, I mean, uh, there are a lot of kind of these uh, cyber sec threats. Uh, then uh, there are definitely uh, challenges for students, no doubts here. So, I mean, we have to educate students as well. I mean, students are much more advanced than teachers today, but at the same time, it's still, it's a matter of educating students. It's maybe rather not about the technicalities, how to prompt, 
but maybe rather kind of about how to learn, how to use this capacity that we have today, right? So how to use it so that instead of providing you the solution, uh, the, the same kind of uh, Gemini or chat GPT will be offering you step-by-step -step learning paths, how to resolve that so that you can learn something out of that. So this is something what we have to teach to the people, to the students. I think that maybe the, uh, the most important and uh, the biggest threat what I see in the AI, and this is something what, what Gunnar mentioned uh, a slightly different way as well, is uh, that, uh, that there is a temptation from student sites to outsource the process of thinking to ChatGPT. And this is kind of the biggest threats what we, uh, what we face today. And this leads us to the point that we have to start to teach to the students again uh, all this notion of metacognition, meta thinking, and so on and so on. So just trying to understand, we, we have to include that as a courses in our uh, schools. Um, I'm, uh, I'm re really kind of practitioner teacher of physics in one of the schools in high school. So I'm staying in front of class more or less on a daily basis. And in our school, in high school, we already introduced the courses of metacognition, meta thinking. Uh, I keep thinking as a headmaster of the same school, I have thinking, uh, uh, I keep thinking about the fact that that maybe we need to introduce certain elements already earlier, not in high school, not in 11th grade, but somewhere, say, around the sixth grades, uh, and trying to kind of to understand to the kids how to think, how to ask the right questions, how to note what you are doing when you think that you are thinking, uh, and maybe at the end to explain to the kids that thinking is fun. This is something what is kind of, a, it may be the, sounds slightly ridiculous, but thinking is fun. So uh, I've already seen that from my point of view that, I mean, when even the kind of the, the calculus so that you are able to calculate things uh, on top of your mind, I mean, this is fun as well. And this is something what when, when, we, when we start to try it with the kids and in certain stages, I understand that it gives them certain advantages in negotiations, in, uh, I don't know, in, in grocery shop, wherever, if you just calculate kind of fast. And the same fun is with thinking. So introducing all this notion of metacognition, that's a very important uh, point as well. Let's uh, maybe make no mistake. I mean, so uh, there, the school with kind of at the age of AI will be different school, right? So we have to think on changing of the methodology of the schools. So for instance, I mean, the old uh, good, well-known homework in quite a lot of areas doesn't make any sense anymore. Again, so as a teacher of physics, I can just prove, it's, it's like this, to prove it that, uh, that uh, the 11th grade high school Estonian uh, language uh, text exercises on physics, even on, on kind of on a high level, Olympiad level, is resolved by ChatGPT like this. Right? So meaning that it doesn't make any sense anymore to give the homework, classical, conventional homework uh, to the students at home. Uh, and, uh, and it means that we have to change the process how we teach. For example, again, in my school, we introduced already in quite a lot of uh, areas, we introduced the notion of the flipped classroom where uh, there are kind of no classical homeworks, but the, I mean, it's, it's, it's a manageable process, uh, but the flipped classroom assumes that, that, that they are studying uh, by the certain process, students are studying uh, the, uh, the new topics in advance, and when they are coming to the class, then we're making experiments, we're resolving some exercise, we're having Socratic discussions on a physics level, kind of Socratic type of discussions. I mean, why do we need, for example, Lorentz force? So Lorentz force is not something what was just developed by physicians, but this is something what is in every single phone. So I'm speaking right now with you because of Lorentz force. And to have these discussions with the students, to, to, to build these kind of bridges uh, for them to understand how exactly all this stuff works, this is something what we, uh, thanks to AI to a certain extent, we may have more time for these kind of discussions. It's uh, quite a wrong understanding from from some people that, I mean, AI will lead us to a situation that students are sitting behind the computers. So I rather believe to the notion that it will give us an opportunity to have more these Socratic discussions, to, uh, to spend more time in, uh, in discussing uh, the things what are really matters. Yeah. Thanks so much.
you. Thank you very much, Ole Gaspar. Once again, I'm coming with the, the same sentence. You can ask questions from Ole Gaspar. Uh, you should have, again, the QR goats there. I'm pleased to use that chance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the very first one here uh, that I actually wrote myself so that I would remember that question as well. Um, in terms of, like, you talked about, like, uh, the teachers and, and that we need to change the way we teach now. How, like, what do you think? How much kind of openness do we have from the teacher side or kind of the willingness to be ready for, for like uh, learning to teach differently today? Well, teachers, um, at least uh, as far as I have seen up to so far, teachers are very open to that. I mean, so definitely, I mean, as is every society, you, uh, you may find some kind of uh, black sheep, mm -hmm. but uh, overall, I would say that the temperature here is uh, pretty uh, comfortable. So teachers are uh, willing to understand, and, and especially in situation when they see that this is something what is inevitable. So we have to change the way how we're thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, in that situation, I mean, they are open absolutely to discuss this, all these topics. Yeah. But in Go terms of... Uh, what, what can we actually do, let's say, from the, uh, from the public sector in, in order to really kind of get the teachers ready for, for, these, uh, for these changes as well? Should there be much more of a program uh, actually kind of started also from, uh, from the Minister of Education? Uh, should we look over the entire way of, of teaching, the, uh, the way we create, for example? Uh, in a panel, we will actually talk about this a bit of more details as well in terms of like the future grading uh, as well. Uh, but, but, uh, but how do you feel about that? Yeah, um, in um, we have a very interesting, uh, very interesting team, or say think tank under the Minister of Education, uh, thinking on uh, how the education process will be changing, uh, not only in Estonia but in Estonia in particular. So, for example, our good colleague Mario is a member of this team here as well, who is sitting, and, and I'm a member of this team, and we are kind of uh, as we speak, we're making the proposals to the uh, ministry. So, what could be changed in the process? So, for instance, introducing this. Uh, the same notion of the massive mm -hmm. uh, trainings for teachers, right? Mm -hmm. So including certain elements of the digital competency to the, to the teacher's competency models, right? So, and so on and so on. So we, we're making kind of, as we speak, we're making these offers to the ministry. All right, uh, then I would uh, wrap it up uh, from, from uh, that side here. Once again, a big applause to Oleg uh, for his overview. <laughs> And um, as we were stepping again a bit closer, uh, we are even more closer now because we just arrived to Tartu, uh, so to University of Tartu. And actually, Gaidi Tulver uh, from the University of Tartu is going to talk about the role of metacognition. Uh, so Gaidi, uh, you are uh, free to join the stage as well here. Hello, everyone from, from my side as well. Uh, and thank you to the previous speakers and Oleg already nicely introduced uh, slightly the concept of metacognition, which I will be talking about more from the perspective of cognitive science uh, as a researcher at the University of Tartu. And um, I will also mainly focus on a few challenges that I have uh, identified in the topic of education and AI uh, development specifically as it relates to metacognitive skills. Uh, but first, to uh, define the terms, I will be the first to admit that metacognition is a very broad term. Uh, there's a lot of dis disagreement about what we should consider when we uh, talk about it. Um, however, uh, most broadly speaking, it can be defined as thinking about thinking, or more specifically, having the ability to be aware of or control your mental processes, such as attention, emotion or memory. And in uh, cognitive science, we like to uh, distinguish uh, metacognition into these two broad categories. So we can talk about awareness or monitoring of your mental states. So when you're listening to a presentation, you have the ability to be aware of your thought process, where your focus is, and uh, notice when your focus is slipping, for instance. And then on the other hand, we have this uh, component of control or regulation. Uh, so not only are we able to notice our focus sleeping, we do have the ability to direct or steer it back towards the presentation at uh, will. Um, and to highlight another example for of how many metacognitive skills we use on a day-to-day -day basis if we think about problem solving. 
That might involve uh, metacognitive skills such as defining the problem clearly, decomposing the task into uh, a series of actions, um, evaluating or monitoring the progress or adjusting strategies where necessary, and then eventually evaluating uh, the outcome as well. And uh, when we talk about this step, it's especially pertinent to mention that we need to have the appropriate level of confidence to be able to uh, estimate the best outcome and choose the best solution. And why is it relevant that we talk about metacognition uh, today or in general? So not only is it something that we use all the time automatically uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but also uh, we know from different studies that having better metacognitive abilities is linked to a lot of benefits that we would like to have the, uh, in advance of personal and career-related success, such as improved uh, time management skills, uh, improved focus, being better at problem-solving or decision-making tasks, and also general well-being and mental health. And uh, we also know that people are different at these skill levels. And some of this is a natural progression that uh, metacognitive abilities develop with age and expertise. But also we do know that there are skills uh, that can be uh, trained, for instance, in an educational context by in uh, including different metacognitive techniques uh, uh, in classes. And uh, for today's talk, I will specifically highlight these novel uh, challenges that we're facing where metacognition uh, can be seen as a key factor, such as dealing with uh, new learning environments or remote learning challenges, and also more critically, the use of AI tools. So firstly, as a brief example from the context of remote learning, I wanted to highlight this one uh, survey, online st survey, which was conducted towards the end of the uh, lockdown uh, of uh, COVID. And it was conducted among Estonian students and teachers uh, to um, inquire and evaluate uh, their coping during this uh, remote learning stage. And uh, they were able to extract these four unique profiles of students from among almost 700 uh, responders. Um, and uh, to summarize the findings, basically we could see that uh, two thirds of the children were able to uh, cope quite well with the remote learning, some of them even being uh, uh, thriving in this scenario, so being very independent learners, uh, but most of them being quite competent at it. And then we have this one third of students who are really struggling during this time. And the core key factor seemed to be that they were not as skilled at, at self-regulating, planning their time. They needed much more external support. Um, and sometimes this would also result in uh, stress, frustration and um, health issues. So this is something to consider. Um, and while this is uh, perhaps a specific uh, example, and we can hope that we won't be uh, needing the challenge of that extent of remote learning in the near future, uh, I think it does speak more generally as well to this uh, fact that if we want to develop autonomous uh, learners, independent thinkers, uh, then uh, metacognitive skills and how to support those in an educational uh, setting is uh, critical. And the second challenge to highlight is um, the widespread use of different types of AI tools and both in an educational as well as more general uh, setting. Uh, and the first thing to consider here is that um, when we think about AI as it stands currently, and I'm mainly relying on the example of generative AI and LLMs, tools such as ChatGPT, that the metacognitive skills in AI itself are quite limited. And it's an active challenge and it's uh, being uh, researched and developed and will likely improve in the near future. But currently, um, AI is not as aware of its own limitations and cannot critically uh, reflect on its own skills. So this means that it puts an incredibly high metacognitive demand on the user itself. Uh, so when we think back to a problem solving um, uh, example and all the tasks involved, including uh, defining the goal, um, uh, task decomposition, monitoring progress and switching strategies, and uh, very importantly, being able to evaluate the quality of the output, this now all relies on the user. Uh, but not only that, it adds uh, new challenges as well, which are only related to AI use. So for instance, not only do we have to know um, how to achieve a task, but we have to know how to convey that in an efficient way in terms of prompt engineering and being able to get the best result. 
So this might involve being aware of tasks that otherwise humans do automatically, such as being aware of the tone. When you're asking for the AI tool to write an email for you, you have to specify that this is the tone that I would like it to include. But also, of course, evaluating the reliability of the output, which means that you have to also have an appropriate level of confidence in your own skill in the do domain to be able to assess if the uh, output was uh, of high quality. And finally, also deciding whether or to what extent to include this AI automation in your workflow. Does it support my output? Um, does it do a better job? And is it supporting my learning or is it uh, simply uh, replacing it? Uh, so, um, yeah, there are several things to consider. And another example I wanted to highlight um, as it relates to how metacognitive skills are critical for how effective the AI tools will be is an example from a study where they compared novice and profession programmers as they were using Copilot uh, for a programming task. And uh, while Copilot did manage to increase the performance uh, of the programmers somewhat, but it also amplified metacognitive problems. Um, and very importantly, uh, it specifically did that for the novices. So again, when we think back to the education example, there might be one third of students who, uh, who might struggle with having enough metacognitive skills uh, to use AI efficiently. Um, so in the study, they found that uh, for uh, Proficient programmers, for example, where, where they were able to use um, the co-pilot to complete their task faster or explore alternative approaches, they were also able to identify and ignore when the comments were unhelpful. Whereas novices um, often reported this disrupted focus because co-pilot was in interrupting their workflow, but also they were more likely to accept the suggestions without being able to tell a helpful from an unhelpful so solution. Um, although it did increase the performance on average, uh, we can also see that it came at a cost for the novices. Uh, they made more mistakes and they produced less secure code, um, also while at the same time feeling this false sense of confidence and having an uh, illusion of having learned something. Um, and uh, these uh, authors also highlighted that this actually widens the gap when we think about the outcome uh, quality as it relates to proficient and, uh, and novice uh, users. So finally, just to highlight the main takeaway from this talk, um, if we think about these two very general, I think very attainable near future goals that we do want to foster more autonomous learners who are able to um, self-regulate, um, uh, critically evaluate sources, um, then we need to consider metacognitive skills and how to better foster them in an educational environment. But at the same time, we want uh, to make most of the opportunities and potential of AI tools. Uh, but we have to maintain uh, some considerations about um, safety, make sure that it is actually benefiting and supporting human learning and uh, not hindering it. And we can think of it from these two aspects, from having to um, improve uh, metacognitive training uh, in the context of early education already, but even beyond education to help support metacognitive skills in humans. And there's a lot to consider from the perspective of uh, how to develop better AI tools. So firstly, developing metacognitive skills in AI to be able to reduce the load they place on currently uh, on the user, uh, but also to um, the opportunity to integrate different metacognitive support strategies already into the tools, which, which can be very helpful also for the educational goal. And in the background, uh, we mustn't forget about the role of cognitive science. So this is the area that I'm representing uh, to still uh, work on improving to better understand metacognition. There is, it is lacking uh, in some areas for, for that as well. So we need to better understand it. And then uh, we can inform these decisions uh, for both, uh, from the education and AI development side. Thank you. That's all for me. I just wanted to put an illustration here of one example of how to potentially integrate metacognitive support into ChatGPT as this hypothetical example. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gadi, uh, to you as well. Uh, once again, I think you have heard that sentence for a thousand of times from me uh, already. Uh, but again, time for the questions. And, uh, and, and maybe I would just take one of them that we already received, meanwhile, that you were talking over here as well. So in what ways can educators and developers support users in managing these metacognitive demands? Mm -hmm. I think I already slightly covered it in my uh, last slide, but... Uh, 
an active goal definitely for AI development in general is to uh, increase its metacognitive skills. So uh, for ChatGPT to also be able to give some sort of uh, output regarding how certain it is, how much confidence should be placed on the output. So that would already reduce some of the needs currently placed on the user who may not have the domain skill or expertise needed to make that decision. Mm. And also then yeah, integrating different strategies already into edu education, but also AI tools to help support and train these uh, skills in people. All right. Um, so far, we haven't received more of the questions, so I would like to say a big thank you, you once again. Um, so, um, in terms of uh, in terms of also the, the today's kind of a schedule, I think we forgot to brought it out as well that you can actually see uh, the entire agenda of today uh, on the homepage. Uh, but also, we have that right over here as well. Uh, so we are just around the corner to have a lunch, but before this, we also have a panel discussion. Uh, then, if we will come back here, we will talk about more on the law and ethics in, in, in cyberspace as well. Uh, then we will again have a bit of a short break for, for just, uh, you know, grab some coffee and, and stretch the legs a bit. And, and then we will come back here to talk about again more uh, specifically about cyber skill cap by the Nordic Baltic Cyber Skills Think Tank, which uh, again, Maria brought it out in, he, in her opening remarks as well. And then we will summarize today. So what have we learned? What could be the next steps as well? And, and, and then uh, on the, uh, again, uh, behind the curtains over here, uh, we're going to have also the Cyber Battle Award uh, ceremony. Uh, but, uh, but now I'm actually uh, excited to uh, start the panel discussion and invite to you uh, on a stage just for a couple of uh, people that we're going to see the names uh, just over here a second. So Oleg, uh, I'm happy to invite you back here. Uh, then Maria uh, and Lars as well. Uh, sadly, Sten, uh, who was supposed to be here from the Estonian Innovation, uh, Estonian Ministry of Education and uh, uh, research, uh, you know, it's uh, November, uh, so people get sick sometimes. Uh, so he sadly uh, wasn't able to join us today, but uh, we will try to, you know, replace him a bit. And Maria, you can, uh, we can have a bit of a, you know, a, oh yeah, you can come closer to me as well, that's fine. All right, um, so we already talked about, uh, again, a lot about like also the teachers and, and their readiness as well. Um, so maybe I, I will kick it off and, and, and kind of have a round here. Um, so in terms of uh, their readiness, are educators prepared to integrate also ARI into their teaching? And what are the most critical areas for training teachers um, on AI tools? And Maria, maybe, you know, starting from, uh, from that side here. What's uh, your kind of a, a view on that side? Well, I have the privilege to have a perspective both from Finland, as you can see the little Finnish flag there, but also from the US. So um, I'm kind of based in both countries. I go back and forth and I think there are similar trends over there as there are here. There's just such a wide gap between the most proficient teachers of today and those that are far, far, far behind. Um, so, and, and I think this is largely correlated with where the schools are located. So typically capital cities um, have, have greater resources and more skilled teachers, and that's not so in the rural areas. So that's something to account for, that the skills gap, gap has this kind of a regional dependency as well. But if you especially compare, you said you have an experience from the US side and now as is this conference especially focusing on the Nordic and Baltic side, do you think there is a big difference also in terms of like, you know, comparing the, the readiness in terms of the countries and, and having that wide knowledge in, in these senses? I think we are doing a lot better here in Europe in terms of standardizing education, having a lot of uh, resources available to the teachers. So even though they don't necessarily have the individualized skills to come up with these programs, they have a whole backbone mm -hmm. of things that are provided by the ministries and, and other our government bodies to kind of fall back on. I think that's far lacking in the U.S. for mm -hmm. sure. But, but Lars, actually, uh, to continue on your side as well here, uh, you know, uh, your perspective in terms of like, how might AI redefine uh, the role of teachers in a, in a classroom as well? Oleg was talking about this, this thing mm. already in his presentation, but your point of view as well here. Yeah, I think that um, AI is a double-edged sword, so we have to know the, the limitations of it. Uh, but I also think that it can enable teachers to get further in a short period of time. But the issue here is that how do you validate that uh, if you create assignments for, for the students or uh, the attending people here, how can you validate the output of it? Um, and I think that actually requires that us as teachers, we know the field very in depth, 
because how can we validate what the AI is teaching us? Uh, so in, in terms of that, I, I think, you know, us as teachers, we should have the same critical thinking as uh, the students should have, actually. But um, I, I think it can help us in order to, to create the assignments faster. But in Denmark, are there any kind of initiatives also from, uh, from the public sector side coming, you know, kind of supporting the teachers in terms of like understanding this better? Because even like, so m I've been working in the Estonian governmental sector for the last seven years time as well. And, and when we were even like, you know, creating the AI Act and getting like the feedback on, 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 on this as well, there were a lot of people that, you know, have been working in the governmental sector for a little while already and maybe even lack of, of the knowledge itself as well. And I think it's kind of the same reflection also in terms of like the school and the teachers that they might not even understand that technology. Is, is Denmark somehow also supporting the process of like, you know, are there any, any I don't know, courses that, that are especially meant for, for the teachers in order to, to, to support them with this? Not that I'm aware of in the time of speaking here. Um, there are initiatives in the organizations where we try to look at, okay, is this safe? Can we use it in a safe manner? Um, and then Companies essentially go buy into to co-pilot with uh, Office 365, and then we know that there are some some issues re in regards to that. Are the data that we share with the AI is that private? Is this something that um, yeah we are in control of? And if uh, if not so, then we can buy into private uh, AIs. But are they really that private? I think there is like a gap there where we have to define: Are there any controls? Are there any limitations we can put in in order to to share? Uh, yeah, the data and what do we share actually. I think this is such an important point. We're looking at kind of we need teachers not only with, with skills in identifying opportunities for AI, but also with skills in understanding the risks with AI. And those are very different domains. <laughs> so where can we apply AI and how do we apply it safely? Those are very, very important yeah. domains to develop. Uh, Oh, like uh, from, from your point of view as well, like you already covered, especially for the teaching method side as well. But uh, when I when I started with my opening remarks as well here, I talked about like the four million uh, also shortage in terms of like the uh, the skills, uh, not the skills, but the, but like workforce in uh, and, and globally, uh, it's it's a huge number. I think if I was correct, it's a bit less than one million here in Europe, and the number is is uh, increasing as we speak, right? Uh, so in terms of like using AI, do you think that? that is going to be the tool for the future, uh, really helping us uh, a bit with, with like this shortage in, in terms of like the workforce as well. Well, in general, <clears throat> in general, I'm very optimistic. So I think that it is uh, a mighty lever uh, what could help teachers uh, to save time, uh, to do more, uh, to be more efficient and so on and so on. But we have to understand that, I mean, we have to uh, work hard in order to make it happen. So uh, you asked, I mean, about this uh, readiness of the teachers and the level of uh, education for them, for teachers. So it's a very important question. So uh, I'm not so much, I don't have so many concerns with regards to readiness. I think that they're ready uh, to, uh, to dive deep in this area. But we have to understand that, that, that educating of teacher, this is teachers in this particular situation, this is something that is absolutely unprecedented. So, because we have to do it in several layers. So uh, we have to talk not only about the technology and even technology, even technology. I mean, that's a matter of the opportunities and threats, exactly like Maria said as well, right? But it's, uh, it's a matter of methodology. So for example, this flip classroom. So uh, the way how you are acting in front of class together with the class and so on and so on. So it has to be changed. And from that point of view, I would say that uh, quite a lot of those skills what teachers uh, used to use up to so far, uh, uh, they will be less useful right now, and we have to kind of, to, to a certain extent, to relaunch the way how teachers are acting. So from that point of view, it's absolutely unprecedented what we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of like going back now maybe to the awareness of, of you, uh, the, the students themselves as well, uh, I mean, you have an experience also with, with you know, a few kids, and, uh, and in terms of like um, do you have any examples that you can share with us uh, of the AI-based tools that can make actually cybersecurity uh, learning more kind of accessible and at the same time also engaging to the students as well? Because like in a lot of ways, people think that it's just tech uh, and, and, and they, they feel also a bit of a, uh, that it's so far from them and then it's not so maybe interesting to be engaged. And if you think about like these uh, young kids that are, you know, doing theoretical hacking just next to us here uh, and, and going around 
around in this room and, and seeing, you know, how excited they are to be part of this. Like, do you also have any kind of an examples or the tools that you really have seen uh, that are working well with, uh, with kids? I can start. Um, so we've been actually uh, piloting CyberCoach in schools. And that's not something um, we, we were very cognizant of the fact that we're like a chat based learning platform, which is great for adults in the workplace. Adults don't necessarily miss these hyper visual, you know, music led games that, that kids are playing. So we thought that for kids, this is going to be so boring. They're not going to like this. But actually, kids seem to be really intrigued by it. And it's like, what's happening next? And it's just such a kind of unfamiliar format to them that it's already intriguing. So we're not even competing in the same category of all of the mind crafts and, and uh, whatnots they're playing on, on their devices, but, but in a, in a whole, whole new ga- category. And that's, that's intriguing. So I think kids, kids are very malleable and they're very kind of eager to try new things and learn, le- learn in different ways. And I think that the uniqueness about CyberCoach is that we can provide the kids an anonymous learning environment as well. Mm-hmm. So they don't have to fear that, okay, I'm going to make a mistake here. And now my friends know, or my teacher knows it's all safe and, and kind of, um, Fun, fun way of learning. So we've had good, good experiences with that uh, in, in schools and in kind of different kind of format compared to their day to day. Lars? Yeah, well, I come from a security company as well. So we try to teach uh, the, the youngsters out there and that would be in, in all ages. What, what are the dangers of this? And uh, what we're looking into here is also uh, what are the deep fakes uh, on the internet right now? And and that goes back to what we just saw with uh, Caddy just to to think critically of where where data comes from and where where it is and what kind of power that it puts in because um, right now that we have seen in Denmark we have regulated against um, uh, artificial created porn that you know where people are put in with uh, creating deep fakes in that sense so so that uh, is something we're starting to regulate but we also show what what dangers can be in that area here because right now there are tools out there already available in the time of speaking here, where you can do these things. So so putting that into perspective and also putting that into a learning to say, okay, what are the advantages and also what are the dangers for it? Because it, it goes both ways in my mind. Mm-hmm. Alec? Uh, with regards to students, uh, I think that um, the biggest uh, threat what we are facing right now, this is something what I mentioned in my uh, speech as well, the biggest threat uh, is uh, the temptation for students to start to outsource the thinking process. And we have to uh, tackle it, we have to deal with that. So, I mean, it's uh, um, in terms of students, I would maybe put uh, the uh, laser sharp focus not so much on technology, but on critical thinking, on metacognition. I mean, it's explaining that thinking is fun, and, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's just great to do the think, you know. So, uh, and, uh, and to, uh, to st- because it's, this is something where we are still better than machines are especially if we are talking kind of this about the capacity of building the uh, the bridges uh, in interdisciplinary areas from chemistry to biology from biology to physics and so on so we are still better than machines and will be in a foreseeable future better than machines here but it assumes that we know how to think mm. it assumes that we have certain skills and desire to think critically yeah. but also cr- the creativity can potentially die out over time Absolutely. because if people don't learn to think and and be creative you know then then creativity will die over time uh, in the worst manner yeah. absolutely so, so our audience can also join the conversation by you know asking uh, questions we already have received also already one question as well that i also personally very much like here um so uh we need superhuman teachers for AI uh, in area where struck, uh, where they are struggling to find where we are struggling uh, to find teachers overall. How can AI maybe be attractive to bring youth into teaching? How do we attract more uh, again younger people into the field of teaching, becoming a teacher? I mean, Oleg, you are working as a teacher today as well. Um, how can we get more? young people and and would AI be able to somehow help us as well in that terms? Well, you know, this question starts from the uh, statement what is already questionable. So we need super teachers, right? So uh, I would uh, kind of, I would rather put the focus on the fact that that, uh, let's uh, let's create the situation environment where we are facing the gradual transition, small steps one by one. So small steps, how to change the way how we are teaching today. So uh, 
I do argue that a lot of teachers who are today in front of class, as we speak, they're right now staying in front of class. They are a capable and willing to do that. So let's just kind of to leverage them in that, right? And, and uh, we will face uh, the reality where the life will be kind of better every single day with that. And, and you also, I mean, I'm going to stick with, with Oleg for one more second here as well. Um, we, we discussed also before about, like, you know, using AI as, as, as kind of a grading of her assessments as well. Uh, what are the biggest kind of, uh, you know, pros and cons in terms of using AI to assess uh, student performances as well? Are you, are you doing this already by, by you know, implementing some, somehow the AI methods too? No, we are not using AI anyhow for yeah. grading or assessments, uh, absolutely consciously. It's a matter of models today, and uh, there are, I mean, at least I have not seen any trustful models for that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there are no such kind of models, but at least I have not seen such kind of models. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, it can, again, so the decision should be, I mean, we, we, we have to be in a situation that decision is done by humans. Right, so uh, the AI could provide certain data, data room, whatever, but decisions should be done by human. So where AI is better than we are today is grabbing and maybe combining and, and layering all this data, what is needed, but humans should be the person who is making the decision. What's your point, Maria, in terms of like, we, we discussed when we had a, you know, off the stage a talk about this as well, and you said that you also see that there might be a punch potential, but like in terms of like, how we can we answer in a way that it's, it's not uh, uh, like, that it's, it's fair and it's unbiased as well. So many of you in this room already might be aware, but this is actually one of the use cases that the EU AI Act aims to regulate, uh, thankfully, since it's a pretty damn scary area. <laughs> Pardon my, my French. Um, so, so it will be considered a high-risk AI model and it will have specific requirements around transparency and safety. Uh, and ethics uh, that are transcribed in the law already today. So that's something that I'm very, very, very happy about because as a cybersecurity professional, it's so easy to see where this is going wrong. Um, I mentioned uh, how we're already seeing the technology hallucinating today. So for me, uh, finding those ways to ensure that whenever we're even, even as a decision support, we cannot be giving those teachers inaccurate data. It, it can't do what ChatGPT and the other likes are doing today, that they're even misrepresenting percentages from materials, which I have referenced in my talk. Uh, so we're going to need to fix that problem and we're going to need to get a lot better at it before we can use that. But at the same time, we understand teachers are overworked. So the more we can automate like these mundane tasks teachers have and, and figure out where they can actually get creative and add value. Uh, that's also going to help us get new teachers into the industry because it's no longer going to be about this just standing in front of a classroom. <laughs> classroom. There's going to be much more diverse methods for uh, teaching children and, and making use of technology. Mm -hmm. but, but I also think that in, in order to support the newcomers, because I think all the young kids that we're seeing here uh, sitting next to us, these are the new generations that we also need to support. And for me as an old timer in this business, I would to, to give them that support in order to say, okay, what is valid data sources? How can we validate this? But then AI can help them express uh, what they want to re represent for, for the rest of the, the classroom. So I, I strongly believe that, that um, the, to, to minimize the hallucinations that you are talking about, Maria, then, you know, that is my job. Uh, and then AI can help express uh, what they would like to, to do in, in the future. So I think that, that uh, the presentation, the wording, all that, that can AI help, with, uh, help us with. Mm -hmm. So the research can be helped with, with the old timers, to say the least. And it's great at creating, like, like we make use of in CyberCoach, these conversational interfaces, because chat-based learning is actually really effective. There's a lot of science that goes, beyond, like, a lot of science behind that, that we learn through dialogue, not so much mm -hmm. through passively watching videos. It's learning peer-to-peer -peer through dialogue is really effective, and that's something that large language models can enable at scale. So that's, that's one of the opportunities that, that are exciting here. Yeah, we we also received one question that um, that uh, came from the audience as well. Um, in, in terms of, uh, there has been a lot of discussions uh, that EU likes to regulate a lot of things. I mean, in in some ways very positively, where we talked about again that uh, we uh, can somehow also the manage the risk aspect there when we have the right laws, preventions, and 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 so on. Um, so the question uh, um, is, uh, how can how can we help EU become a more innovative, less defensive actor in the cyber arena and countering strategic disadvantages in a dangerous geopolit geopolitical environment. 
anybody wants to take that one. That how is actually we... a good question. Yeah. Um, and I think that when we look at, at how does that work today in, in the businesses, uh, the first thing that comes into my mind is that the Center for Internet Security, that is a collaboration uh, where you have a lot of good practices being brought, uh, brought out to the to the masses. And I think a similar uh, thing should be created here. And that should be based in the different countries to, to make a, a group that, that collects all the knowledge that is collected in that sense and then being centralized in Europe somehow. Um, I, I think the answer is simple, but then again, yet sophisticated. It, it, one of the important yes, answers as well is education. I mean, we're talking about education a lot today, but that's one of the solutions here mm -hmm. because today, I mean, we, we're electing people to make these big decisions that are going to have very far-reaching consequences for an, our entire society. So the, so the more our general public, every citizen has the skills to evaluate their skills and get really skillful individuals into these decision-making positions, the better better our, we will be uh, positioned as a society, the more resilient we're going to be as a society against all this. Well, but I think it, yeah, sorry. Regulation is not necessarily bad, right? So uh, mm -hmm. as long as you are involving real experts in the process. So uh, if we just uh, can ensure the fact that the real experts, those who understand what is happening in this area, those are involved in creating the regulation, that regulation could be very... Uh, we have seen in Europe a lot of examples of regulation what has a positive impact, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Uh -huh. But but in terms of like, we, we focused a bit on, on the EU side and regulating and everything. Are there any countries that we should look up for uh, outside of the EU that really has find that kind of a balance there in terms of, again, including AI more into, you know, uh, also in an ed as a educational system and then for the cybersecurity sense? Because, you know, uh, my background, again, from the defense uh, sector side was always that we were looking into what the Singapore is doing also, you know, Israel and their methods in order to implement the AI models into teaching the cybersecurity skills and so on. Have you have you seen any any good also examples on a on a national level somewhere that really has worked and, and where like EU should also look outside for as well? I think we're so immature in regulating this new technology that there aren't really, like the EU AI Act is really a landmark law in this sense globally. And I mean, if you look at GDPR, the privacy side regulation, I mean, it took US eight years <laughs> and we're now coming up with national <laughs> privacy laws and we're of course copycatting a lot <laughs> from the European laws. So, so I think EU is actually leading the game in terms of regulation in this space. Uh, there are innovations in terms of using the technology, but I think, uh, we need to think before we use it. So I think this approach where we're already, I guess, a few years late with the with the regulation, but at least it's coming now. And, and perhaps it will um, have a positive impact before we get too deep into using this technology everywhere in our society. I totally agree with that because I think this have actually exploded for the past two years. Yeah. Uh, ChatGPT Copilot has just reached the market. And, and when that reaches the masses, I think that that is where you put the power into the people's hands, and then we have to see, okay, what will this uh, Im implode in, uh, or Im implement in our society today? We we haven't seen the top of the iceberg yet, I think. Mm. So, okay. so that it, what we need is to, to build up some some knowledge around that in order to, you know, start to regulate into it. I I totally agree with that. So it's uh, it's exactly the place where the ice is meeting with fire, so meaning the conservative system is meeting with, uh, with the, the age of innovation. Mm -hmm. And once again, so education should be conservative. So it's absolutely embedded inside the education. It should be uh, conservative. And education cannot just take every single technology what is appearing mm -hmm. and say that it's for granted that let's start to use it. So it's a, we have to understand what is a better way to to, uh, to implement the technology. So I think it's absolutely normal that today our, I mean, Estonia today is rather on the forefront, I, I truly believe that, in uh, trying to understand how to embed that. Uh, but uh, I have not seen any uh, any kind of, uh, any countries that have already introduced some notions on governmental level. At least I have not seen that. But, uh, but in terms of, again, we, we talked about also a lot of kind of misunderstanding of AI and kind of the fear of, 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 of the AI, I think in both from the student's perspective and also from the, from the teacher's perspective as well. 
do you have any kind of examples like what really has worked? Is, is it just, again, uh, the simple answer, we should educate them more, they should understand this more, or, or just something from your kind of careers, your experience that really has worked in order to get rid of this kind of a massive fear of the AI? I guess when we, when we discuss with you after your, your keynote as well, the, the, uh, the, again, opportunity side and the threat side there as well, uh, how can we make sure that, again, there is, you know, not the fear, but actually seeing this as a chance of, of doing something better, doing something master, uh, faster and, and mastering your skills in, in that sense? Anybody? Any, any, any examples from... Uh, I think there are some th things that we don't fear enough. <laughs> I think Laris uh, brought, brought up the important uh, angle of the child sex abuse material and how it is like a very real risk when we're just uploading kids' pictures into into these systems. Uh, that that is exploding, um, and that's something that we don't talk about enough. Um, figuring out way to ways to prevent that and prevent actual real life harm harm to children. But on the other hand, we also have these unfounded fears that are preventing our opportunities. So so teachers are afraid that you know they're going to be replaced by this technology. And as Oleg said, we are very very far if. Like ever, that would be possible <laughs> with with this technology. It will be a great assist and a great co-pilot, exactly as Oleg said. But it, it's not something that can replace yeah. humans. Um, not 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 for the foreseeable future. Well, in my experience, I've, I've noted that one of uh, few, several of my students have used it, used it as a um, secretary service, as as you know, writing the big text and then. Uh, changing that afterwards so that can get the students faster uh, doing assignments but then again they also have to know how do we find the right answers and i think sometimes both as teacher but also as, as technology we have to take a, a step back to say okay how do we find the real answers and then we can use this as a sparring partner uh, to, to maybe ask questions to say okay how can i find solutions for this and that and then we can uh, approve it or, or test it out uh, as normal education would be anyway. So, so testing it out and, and making the bulk work for us, basically. That can be the positive benefit. Yeah, I just on, on positive examples, I just a couple of weeks ago, I had example with one of my students. Uh, it's a middle school student, not a high school student. Uh, they faced a challenge with uh, just kind of square roots uh, type of exercises. And I showed to him, and it's very kind of introvert type of student, right? So it's, uh, he needs a time for himself. And he, I mean, uh, it's maybe to a certain extent, I mean, it's easier for him to, uh, to be alone and to, uh, to work with computer. And I showed to him how just with regards to kind of with uh, the uh, chat GPT app, what is in a phone, what is kind of what is able to speak with him, right? So you can just speak with it. Uh, how you can, uh, how it can guide you through the resolving of the exercises so that it's kind of, it's not giving you the solution but it's hinting you that what if you consider kind of taking this step? Now, what if you consider taking this step? And so on and so on. And it's pretty gamified for a student. And in a couple of days, he came back and said, oh, I understand how it uh, should be done. Because it's kind of, it's again, it's assistant what is uh, working in parallel with teacher and helping this particular student uh, using this technology. What could we more imagine? Yeah, just for the, again, uh, the manual task and then things that are taking us a lot of time that replace them as well. You, you, this is exactly what we see with CyberCoach as well, like yeah. providing you're in that classroom yeah. and, and letting yeah. those introverts learn from kind of one-on-one -on -one yeah. environment as well. So kind of complementing the classroom learning with this kind of a more like... So, so kind of like a very personalized approach exactly. also. And I, I think that's something that is also very, very important because like in terms of like when I used to go to school, like everybody were like taught the same way, uh, but like we were so different and then actually you needed much yeah. more of maybe a personalized approach. And I think that's also where AI can can play a big uh, part as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, sorry. No, 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 just that we can have individual students already today choose that, okay, I want to learn from CyberCoach in a funny way, yeah. or I want to learn in a more serious way. I need more explanations, I need more help so we can adapt, use this technology, these large language models to really adapt to the individual kids' needs. So that's something that will profoundly, of course, affect um, being able to get all the kids on the same level, regardless of their backgrounds. Yeah. But I also think one of the positive things can be, as, as Oleg said, that rephrasing uh, the answers. So, yeah. you know, 
people learn differently. So if we can rephrase the, the answer or the, the, the questions a little bit different, that is where AI come into play because you have a lot of data sets it's probably been, going to be trained on. So that has a lot of different wordings and, and uh, maybe teaching, let's say, programming, that would be a hard thing for a lot of people to, to learn and yet easy to, to get hands off. Uh, so you know, AI can actually speed up that process, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think also the language learning side as well, actually, uh, is, is something that in terms of like, you know, I also use like ChatGPT for like when you're like really in hurry and you need to write something very fast. And and, and then like actually learning a lot of new words that I, I wouldn't use myself. And, and actually you go through that material and you learn a lot of things. And I, I know that also there are methods that you can use AI in terms of like, you know, having a conversation with you in mm -hmm. different languages as well. And, and you can set the tone again that there is a situation and that's the, uh, the tone I would like to uh, hear there as well. I like. And uh, here comes one quite important point for students as well. So it's, I mean, it's absolutely okay if they are chat GPT mm -hmm. and there's absolutely okay if they are kind of asking chat GPT to do something for them. But what I'm uh, strictly against of is just copy pasting without understanding what was happening there. So it's, uh, I mean, if for example, in, in a classes of Python, uh, they are just kind of copy pasting certain pieces of the code and inserting in uh, Colab. I mean, that's not okay. But if you understand what exactly is happening there, so if you are able to, uh, I mean, this is something what we have to teach students to uh, to learn how to understand what uh, what have you got from there, and then you are learning by yourself as well. Yeah, kind of structuring this by yourself as well, because I think even like on the social media and even like receiving emails, I think all of you can agree that sometimes like you can really understand that this wasn't written by that person because there's a lot of things that like you you know are related to uh, the you know ChatGPT as well, and and then you know social media posts especially uh, that it's something that it doesn't sound natural, and I think for for the teachers as well that they can really identify when when this is not coming from from uh, from from their specific students when they don't speak that way and, and that way as well. So. Hiring today is a nightmare. <laughs> so everybody can sound like the perfect applicant by using these technologies. And I think another, uh, to this point, another good use case for um, all these language models today is that we can actually try to figure out, like, is, is what we're thinking actually new or is it something that everybody already knows? So if ChatGPT gives the answer, then you can pretty fairly <laughs> establish that, okay, I had no <laughs> new creative thinking here, but it's a nice way to kind of Sound, use it as a sounding board for your ideas. Mm -hmm. well, well, normally, if, if uh, some of my students would use AI, I would probably ask them to say, okay, you got this from AI, can you explain that, what happened behind that? <laughs> and that usually tends to put people off using that chat GPT because <laughs> that, you know, it, it removes the, the actual problem solving here. Yeah. So, but, but I think having a, an, an attitude towards it, it, we have to think of it. It's not here to go away soon. It's probably here to stay. So how can we work together with it in, in order uh, to not, not against, combat it? Yeah, yeah against it. Against. Yeah. Like you. yeah, what you mentioned, I mean, Annette, it's, uh, it's one more kind of quite substantial danger uh, in the area of AI is that today the uh, cost of creating the content exponentially uh, goes down. So, I mean, it's in tens of times, right? Uh, it goes down. And as a result of that, we have an enormous, unprecedented amount of the trash content today, right? So again, mm -hmm. for us, it's, I, I consider that rather as a smoke, uh, what is kind of around the fire is already some kind of smoke. Uh, but for us, again, it's rather an opportunity on that particular example to teach students how to understand, I mean, mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what is real information and what is just kind of some trash created yeah. content. I, I, I actually wanted to go in exactly that direction and talk about like a bit of like, you know, just some misinformation and especially, you know, towards the students and, and things that we believe that we see online as well. And, and I just had a conversation. I, I came from uh, Brazil yesterday and it was one of the companies that I met and they had a study trip to China. And, and we had a long conversation about using, you know, TikTok also for the educational level and, and actually like a very heated discussion because I'm, I'm very much against it. And again, everybody that are here in a room like I don't recommend as a cyber expert to have that application on your phone and and in, in terms of like again how we are being manipulated in terms of uh, teaching uh, that for Chinese students uh, they don't even have that application they have a complete different application very similar to uh, to TikTok as well and and then they are basically using TikTok for really educating their uh, their students and and for us the algorithms are completely something else and, and I think we are really lacking today any kind of, you know, awareness raising in schools about, you know, because I think 
at least 90% of uh, students in schools have TikTok because this is so cool. And, 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 and your classmates have, and you find a lot of information there that you think that might be true, but actually we're not capable of even understanding. And, and, and so what, what do you think? How big of a challenge this is today? And, and are there any methods that we can uh, use also technology or schools to kind of fight against that? Because I feel like it's not just, it is actually a huge threat to our entire democracy, I, I would put it that sense. It's hugely, hugely important teaching children, not just like information li literacy, but algorithmic li literacy, being able to recognize these different um, information kind of influencing attempts at scale. Uh, what we have learned is that actually this kind of uh, anonymous technology that you chat with <laughs> can even be more credible uh, for, for children. So, uh, so what, what we do in like a co company setting is we provide the platform for the company to train their employees, but they can also train their like employees' families with it. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of data on this that uh, how children are using it and how how parents are learning it using the tool to educate um, themselves on how to educate their children. And there's a, a power in this combination. So you have a message coming from your teacher, you have the same message coming from your parents, and then kind of enforced by technology. Yeah. So you have it coming from different sources. So it's not just that, you know, it's my mom said this, and I don't like my mom, so I'm not going <laughs> to believe them, but I might be more inclined to believe uh, this technology. So kids, of course, are very different, but kind of having... The same, multiple same sources of truth. I think that's mm -hmm. that can be powerful. A Danish well, example of maybe if as well. <laughs> well, I would say that the, a lot of the young kids that I've met uh, is lured into that algorithm because mm -hmm. uh, you know it, AI might sift through what people like to look at and and how long with time we're looking at it. So I think that is actually one of the, the issues we have right now. But if we take a little bit uh, further to to look at what does um, the power of AI actually is or what the behind is. We, we have an election going on in uh, the foreign countries right now. And um, looking at uh, looking at the power that the, for the potential they have, uh, they say that it might change the output of the election. Absolutely. And teaching that to kids to say, okay, if you want to learn something, get into uh, you know physical groups. I think we have to take, take a step back here. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I so yeah, it's and, about the uh, risk and an opportunity in yeah. a very concrete way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's make no mistake. Uh, uh, the AI is able, and we do have an examples today, AI is able to manipulate the unprepared human, right? Mm. So we, uh, you can just kind of a little bit YouTube, and then you will find some examples, definitely. Uh, we do have these examples. So... Uh, Let's prepare the people because the key word here is unprepared the human, right? So uh, they are able to manipulate unprepared human. Mm -hmm. So let's prepare them because it's AI is uh, luckily or unfortunately just a reality. So we have to uh, to learn how to live with it, mm -hmm. right? And I think especially what really, really, again, another thing that really scares me personally as well is, again, the information that kids are uploading online without really knowing and this very cool applications based on the AI that are actually, you know, using your information, storing that information and using this for a very bad purpose as well. I, I mean, do you remember, I think um, it, it was also the thing in, in Finland and in Denmark as well, that there was this AI application that you had to upload like 10 pictures of yourself and it made you like a cartoon. Uh, kind of a not a player, but I don't know even how to call that. An act, uh, like, uh, uh, yeah, you were like an actor in a cartoon, and then everybody and a lot of kids were like uploading a lot of their own like selfies and pictures and everything, and that went straight away to China, where they're actually really using these pictures not for a good uh, good purpose. So in, in terms of this as well, like you know, are we are we dealing this enough today? Because I, I or like again. Should there be more of the things that we should do either from the government side, more of a campaign, it's going to the schools, having the lectures, like talking about these kind of a case studies. And I don't know, even like getting closer to the uh, to the students by using their social like influencers uh, that are talking about these cases and raising their awareness what not to do uh, in order to lose your information and not to even speak about like, you know, uh, parents that are uploading pictures of their half naked kids and, and then they go somewhere uh, again uh, that can be very much used against their uh, their kids uh, in the future. Well, 
if you're asking, I mean, are we dealing enough with that? So we never do, yeah. It's never enough, right? So it's yeah. never enough. And AI is, uh, is uh, developing as we speak. Mm -hmm. So China as AI superpower, let's make no mistake. Yeah. I mean, a China today is AI superpower. So they are developing as we speak. So uh, there is never enough. But still, even in that situation, every single day, every single minute, you have yeah. to deal with that and you have to explain to the kids, I mean, what are those dangers? What you have to have in mentioned yeah. here and so on and so on. Yeah. I think there's another side of this. So on one hand, it's like this extremely private information of small children that can be used for heinous, heinous things. But it's also like their, their um, IP rights. Like if a child uh, produces a great story and, you know, the teacher uses an AI checker, you know, yeah. was this AI? Mm. No, it wasn't. It turns out this kid's a genius and <laughs> he's yeah. going to make millions one day writing awesome books but then the kid can't do it because all of its <laughs> all of their creativity is already in ingested into the algorithms and the algorithms will do that in in the future for them so kind of understanding that there are many aspects of the kids uh, pri private data, personal data um, that that we need to protect, and that the teacher really is at a has has to have a role in there mm. because the kids don't necessarily have a voice. And like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it feels too. I don't want to give my data there. I don't want to do that. Kids can't usually object to this. It's part of the classroom activity. So we need teachers much more aware of of this uh, than they are today, unfortunately. And that's hard work to do. Well, <laughs> one example is that uh, for a few weeks back we had a presentation for for young kids in the school. And uh, one of these presentations was actually recording five minutes of voice, five minutes of video, and you can manipulate that. And you couldn't barely see the difference. Uh, I created the video and I also created the, the voice. One of my colleagues, he, he synthesized that. So you can create fake videos within the, your palm of your hand within five, 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and then you're set off. And I think that is actually a problem because if, if a lot of the young kids out there, they upload videos and especially on TikTok, mm -hmm. can that be manipulated? The, the short word it would be yes, uh, with no questions asked. Mm -hmm. Lars, but what do you think I and mean, what we can do in that situation? What I think that, that education and, and actually, in my experience, I think if we should po show a problem, we should be able to show the problem so people can see, okay, what are we against here? Because when we talk about AI, we haven't seen the top of the iceberg, but if we can find areas where we can pick out to say, okay, this is the problem mm -hmm. and, and showcase that somehow, I think that, that uh, opens the eyes for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And kind of like also making sure that our our kids and students are a bit more suspicious also of the information that they, they see online. And, and, and this kind of a critical thinking, I think, is, is something. But, but again, that's why we need the case studies to actually show that this information that you saw wasn't actually correct and, 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 and these case studies can work. I'm, I'm taking the last question that we have received from the audience and then we will wrap it up and everybody you know, can go and enjoy some lunch time as well. Um, so you, uh, Oleg, talked about that, again, China as a superpower. Nobody has a question that they are in, in AI, but you know, not maybe the society that we would want to uh, be in terms of like respect to our, our, our data and our, our rights. Um, so there was a follow-up question on that side as well, that regulation is a defensive method. Uh, innovation is power. China and the US have it. Uh, the EU doesn't really. Is education so much different also between the US and the EU and maybe also including China here as well? Does anybody, because I was thinking when I saw that question, I don't have any, any idea how they are teaching maybe also, you know, AI and, 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 and tech in schools in China, but, uh, but this, when we think about innovation, technology, uh, the education in the US, you mentioned before, Maria, that you think that we are even a bit better, uh, but um, any, any idea uh, or, or knowledge, how, how does it work in, in China or, or more maybe somewhere else in the US as well? Well, when I'm saying that, that China is superpower in terms of AI, I mean rather kind of these base technologies. Yeah. So I have no clue, honestly, okay. how they are tackling this topic in terms of education okay. today. Uh, but I'm pretty confident that, that they have certain approaches there. So uh, and we have to uh, be aware of that. Uh, with regards to the US, and rather kind of uh, in the same layer where Maria is. So uh, at least as far as I have heard, uh, they don't have any centralized approach there. So there are uh, some of the pretty good initiatives. I know that in, a, in the state of Washington, for example, they have pretty good initiatives in, uh, in certain schools, mostly in private schools, what I have heard of, uh, but there are no centralized approach. So I think that here, rather, both in regulation and both uh, and in understanding, I mean, how to tackle this in general education, I think that we are quite, in, 
quite in the forefront right now. Exactly, and we have really, really impressive EU-wide collaborations as mm. well. One of one of the examples in the cyber education space is the Cyber Citizen Initiative, mm -hmm. which involves uh, several EU countries together working on citizen education in cyber. Or even like the Finland and, and Estonia are even sharing the spaces of AI, like a, a free course that you can do online. Also, uh, again, together with between the University of I think Helsinki or and and, and Estonia yeah. as well. So that's exactly. also like a good example. Well, the last initiative that I've heard of is that having an attitude towards AI, uh, we can look for ENISA here in Europe. That is the, mm -hmm. the security agency we have here in Europe. They actually have uh, guidelines on, on how to regulate that and, yeah. and control that in, in companies. So it's worth having a look at. All right, but then uh, let's wrap it up uh, so that everybody can take a bit of a break, uh, think about what you heard here, and then again, uh, what would be your contribution in that sector to really make sure that we have enough knowledge about use of AI and, and, and cybersecurity and how to really take more of this as a, as a chance for opportunities uh, and, and not so much on, on the big threat that is, is facing us. So we are coming back here uh, one past, uh, or half past one, and, and, and then we will continue to talk about law uh, ethics and, and especially in the ethical hacking and AI uh, correlation there as well. So uh, go and enjoy some mingling time and lunch. And, and if you could join me for a last round of applause for our panelists here on the stage with me. All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a great lunch break, and we are now back with our. Uh, event here today. Um, so before I will ask the first speaker on the stage, let's go through a bit of an agenda. Uh, so the next session will take around for an hour. Um, so we are going to talk about, again, the law and ethics here. Um, so we're going to have two presentations and then also one panel discussion. Then at uh, 2.30, uh, we're going to have, again, a bit of uh, 15 minutes of a short break for to grab some coffee, to get some energies up and running. And then we will end up the day uh, with another presentation uh, regarding, again, from the cyber skills think tank side. And then there will be also the last uh, panel of the day. And then uh, all the panel moderators will actually summarize today and will also give suggestions to all of the stakeholders here, what could be the next steps that we could take home from here and, and some of the just the key takeaways of, of today as well. Uh, and, and then at uh, 4.30, we are heading here to the Cyber Battle Award uh, ceremony. So a couple of hours to go, uh, but I can promise you that it's going to be a lot of fun here. Uh, so for the first speaker now here on the stage, I am very, very excited to ask Rainer Ratnik, who is the Baltic COO and attorney at the law at uh, Wide and Legal. And he is going to talk about ethical and legal aspects as part of cyber security, so go have a little fun. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Rainer. So uh, we are having a panel discussion uh, as uh, the biggest part of this session. And to kick it off, uh, me and Henry, we're going to do uh, two short presentations, uh, which are essentially the first cornerstones for the discussion, because the rule is that law should be explained in simple terms because otherwise it's only for lawyers, but we need a wider discussion. So two short presentations. My first presentation is about white hat slash ethical hacking. So uh, the reason I more or less I'm able to talk about this topic is uh, because my, my background as a lawyer uh, I've been working in the law firm setting for seven years. Uh, also, uh, I've been four and a half years in software. Uh, so my view on those topics is, I'd say, more practical. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, responsible disclosure and so forth. So I actually have written such policies on my, myself and, and see it from that perspective. So. White hat hacking, what is it? Uh, the general uh, description and the definition seems to be that everybody says that it's a ethical security hacker and the ethical part means that the intent is to help. Uh, but there's a paradox because the intent uh, 
will be understood not before the event where it's going to be somebody's going to get hacked, but after, because we don't know after the fact what will be the real implication. So the question to ask to make it simpler is if Robin Hood, the king of thieves, stole uh, for, for, from the rich and gave to the poor, did he ever leave some stolen gold for his own good? So what what is specifically, uh, what does make the intent ethical or not unethical? So let's have a different scenario here. Uh, Robin Hood steals a cigarette from a smoker. Does it make it ethical stealing? Everybody would say, would say no, it doesn't. Because even though smoking is bad, we still have the presumption that you should not take somebody's things away. And also Robin Hood, hero for some, but a criminal for others. So the general misunderstanding about ethical hacking is that uh, people think that if something is ethical, therefore it is legal. But the problem here is that this is the really, really wrong starting point for solving this puzzle. Because uh, when we look at the law, then the law actually doesn't differentiate based on intent, but rather from the perspective of the ground. So if we ask the question, does criminal law differentiate between hacking and ethical hacking, or hacking and hacking, the answer is, short answer is no. But the long answer is that without the ground, uh, if, if we have a ground for hacking, like a contract, consent, or the law, then ethical hacking actually becomes ethical. So the question actually isn't the term, the, the, about the term ethical. The question is rather about if there is a ground. So in a wider scope of uh, what does the law say, not going into too deep there, is that uh, the criminal law thinks about and asks about the consequence. Uh, and there are several grounds where you can, uh, you can be charged and also in some cases already preparing for hacking is a criminal offense. And there are practical examples just from this year. There was a 14-year-old kid who hacked into a system, stole some data, uh, the prosecutor's office was really kind and decided not to push too heavy. However, the problem is that the civil liability still stands. So, is there a practical problem? Yes, uh, because the general understanding that ethical hacking arises from the intent, I didn't want to do anything bad with those those. Uh, those accesses that I got, but the problem is that you need a ground. So, if you take one thing away from this presentation, uh, then it is that intention is irrelevant, ground is relevant. So, what is the ground? Uh, it's a usually in a form of a consent or a contract. Uh, and uh, the most usual example is a bug bounty program or responsible disclosure. Uh, so what does it mean? So if you are a ethical hacker or white hat hacker, you find out some bugs, get paid for it. Uh, companies publish such programs on their websites. You can find them easily. Also, uh, what's quite common that I've seen myself as well uh, is that hackers reach out, ask, hey guys, do you have a bug, bug bounty program? Yes or no? And then something may, might happen, something good even. And there are platforms about bounty programs, so you can go and discover perhaps even thousands of opportunities. So if one needs to hack, and wants to hack because this is in form, form of self-expression, then there are ways to do it with grounds, 
This means ethically and uh, enjoy life. So how does a bug bounty program in practical terms work? Uh, you as a hacker find out that there is a program, then you review the terms of the program because it's really important that there usually are exclusions that say you cannot do this, this, and this. Uh, DDoS is the most uh, common, uh, what you see everywhere. Uh, and you find weaknesses, and then you might even get paid. So the wider question of this whole event for this uh, panel is, what should we teach about the youth about these topics? And these are the key takeaways. First, intention doesn't make anything ethical. Second, hacking without a legal ground, consent, contract, is a ground for, as a, it's a criminal offense and ground for civil liability as well. You might, be get, you might be sued in the civil court, claim damages, so forth. There are bug bounty programs that you can use, and when you use them, you must read the terms. Uh, if there is no program available, just send an email, ask. It might not be public. And also, as a general question, should we change the law? And this is more relevant for the panel. What we could do is we could theoretically change the criminal law and not publish underage hackers. However, this doesn't exclude civil liability, which, which might be even a bigger problem. Uh, also, what is next then? Shall we allow underage people to steal and allow physical violence? I guess no. We could have governmental bug bounty programs for the states. In Estonia, at least two years ago, we had one, which is good. I don't know if it's still there, but really, really good. This should be done everywhere. And we also could create like best, best practice uh, bug bounty programs published for the general public and companies to use. So this is all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's, uh, let's connect and giving this over to Annette. Um, so uh, I, I do already have the questions uh, once again. Uh, now you should have a little bit more energy after the lunch break. Uh, I, I, I can tell that people actually have a little more energy, so we already have received some questions as well. Um, so I'm going to take the first one over here as well. Uh, so uh, what ethical guidelines should white hat hackers follow to avoid any kind of legal issues in the future? You must have a legal ground for accessing the system you're accessing. That's a very concrete answer. I mean, is, again, t again, talking to a person that comes from the law sector, so so that's kind of uh, uh, clear. So, what are the uh, what are some of the high-profile legal cases involving white hat hackers, and what can we learn from these? Uh, I showed just one uh, this uh, this uh, in this presentation, but uh, when I talked about this presentation with with my colleague. Uh, Gregory Palm, and then he, he said that, yes, this is a really practical program. Whenever I go to uh, the police station, I see a bunch of uh, gentlemen who look like hackers, and I'm <laughs> pre presuming that they are hackers, and so this is really practical. I guess uh, these are not most prominent cases, and the, when, when, when people in Estonia get caught for doing stuff in Estonia, the biggest cases are cross-border, huge hacks, uh, and uh, in those cases, this is a different, a different uh, story altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, but in practical terms, it's a really day-to-day -day business. So especially if you are a young hacker, just learning, perhaps don't know how to do it all super properly and well, so might get caught. All right, let's take the last one over here. Uh, so if you could give one of the recommendations to you, uh, let's say, because we also have people here from private sector. So how can these organizations ensure that their white hat hacking activities comply with the laws and regulations? So one of the recommendations, because we have like one minute. <laughs> uh, one recommendation is that when you are creating a bug 
bug bounty program, then please consult a data protection lawyer because uh, it's uh, what you're publishing essentially is a contract. You must uh, think it through. This is not a thing that a, a like a IT person would, would understand fully because there are terms that you need to add. Just copy pasting from somebody else might not do the trick, especially when you're copy pasting from the US. In Estonia, you would have to add also a data processing addendum and so forth. So you must be smart. But if you do it properly, it will be there serving you for years. All right. Then thank you very much. A big round of applause to Rainer. And your brother is so ready to come on a stage as well. So actually, Henry Ratnik, uh, and uh, he's going to talk about AI and cybersecurity. And he is, by the way, also attorney at the law uh, and go head of IT IP law at Widen Legal. So the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you. So um, let's talk about AI. Woohoo! Everybody's favorite subject. So I'm going to... AI and cybersecurity, and uh, more about AI. And I'm going to talk about the common pitfalls which should be and could be avoided by businesses using AI tools or regular people using AI, for example, in their schoolwork or whatever they want to do with it. Uh, as any good presentation starts with a long introduction of the presenter, uh, that's me. My name is Henry. Uh, I am capable of wearing a suit, as it, as it can be seen from the picture. Uh, as said, I'm attorney at law, head of the co, uh, a co head of the IT IP practice at uh, law firm Wyden. I studied in Tartu, so it's good to be back here. And I'm a lawyer by day, but a tech nerd by night. So I love doing IT law. Mm. So um, the question is why? The question is why we are talking about AI and why we are talking about law. Uh, and the simple answer is because AI is very popular. And this is no surprise to anyone. Of course, we know that AI is popular. People are talking about ChatGPT almost every day. But uh, I want to draw your minds to the fact that um, everybody knows Instagram, Instagram app. Uh, it took two and a half years for Instagram to gain 100 million active users. The same took TikTok nine months, but ChatGPT reached 100 million active users just with two months. So this is a very clear example that AI is very popular, everybody is using it, and this is why we should talk about also the legal stuff. Um, in my short presentation here today, I want you to take home four legal things to know when using AI. Whether you're using it as a company, as a regular person, or however. And the first thing I want to tell you is kind of obvious, read the terms. Every AI tool comes with terms and conditions. It's a, it's a contract, you should read it. When you rented your apartment, for example, you read the rental contract probably. When you bought your house or you're going to buy it someday, then you're probably going to read that contract as well, right? So you should also read the terms and conditions which, which come with the, with the AI tool. Um, thing is that you are not probably able to negotiate them because they do not come in a word draft. You just see the PDF or wall of text on online. But the thing why you should read them is that it gives you the understanding of the risks that you are involved in and you know your rights and obligations. And if the terms are very bad, extremely bad, and we are going to talk about it in a few minutes, then you know you shouldn't use that AI tool. For example, choose another AI tool in that case. Um, and you also know for what to use it for. For example, you want to do pictures there, you want to create a song on, with AI tools, you want to process text or whatever. And if those terms and conditions, you read them, you do not understand anything. You do not understand anything because they are complex, they are long, they are 20 pages long, ah, then perhaps don't use them. The second thing is uh, what can I put into the AI system? And you can quote uh, me on that, but uh, AI is like a bowl of soup on this picture. It's like a bowl of soup. You put some stuff in and the, something goes into the pot, you know, you, you're not very sure because sometimes it's a black box, it's like a soup, you know, and uh, then a bunch of stuff comes out. Mm. 
the question what you should ask is, what can I put into the AI tool so I would actually own this stuff? So, for example, if I want to, if I want to write a poem, I write a poem, I want ChatGPT to make it better. ChatGPT, dear ChatGPT, please write that poem better. Or I will take a picture of Big Ben, very originally, using my iPhone or whatever. And I say to the AI tool, please Photoshop it to make it better, remove the clouds or whatever. Then the question is, do I still own the intellectual property rights of that photograph or that poem? And this depends. You have to read the terms to understand it. Some AI tools, terms say that whatever you put into the AI, you will lose the rights. It's not very common, but some AI tools have it. For example, ChatGPT is a very reasonable program in that sense because it tells that you still own your rights when you put some stuff into the ChatGPT. Another question is, um, is confidentiality guaranteed? For example, I have a headache. Uh, I have a headache, I feel bad, uh, my, my throat is hurting. What's wrong with me? Dear ChatGPT, please tell me, do I have some serious health issues? So the question is whether it's confidential or will this kind of stuff go online? So you should also be worried about whether the stuff is, is confidentially covered, whatever I put in there. And I'm not talking about only illnesses, but for example, if you are like drafting a contract and you want to use AI tool to help you draft the contract, then this kind of data that you put into the AI tool is kind of confidential and kind of sensitive. So you should read the terms to understand whether they uh, guarantee the confidentiality. Also, good old GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation from the EU, this also applies. Because much of the AI tools are developed and uh, they are run from US servers, you should also ask the question whether I can actually send any personal data there. For example, if I want to use the AI tool for my business, for example, I'm an accountant, I want to calculate uh, the salaries next month for my employees. Can I put their uh, wages data into the AI tool? Can I put their names in the AI tool to help me calculate this stuff? You should, you should look at the terms and understand whether the GDPR is covered in the terms and conditions of the AI tool. So we talked about what to put into the AI tool, but since the AI tool is like a bowl of soup, something also comes out. It can be, can be the soup. So the, the question here is, the third question is, what can I actually do with the AI output which I gain from, from the AI tool. For example, I asked AI to write me a song, I asked AI tool to write me a poem, uh, a contract, whatever. The thing is that this kind of output, which is created and which is original, like poems, like photographs, like songs, are usually protected with copyright laws. It is an age-old argumentation whether uh, something that is created by robots can actually be protected by copyright laws. But let's not get into that. This is a very specific uh, discussion. But usually it is. Usually when AI tool pushes out a song, pushes out a poem or whatever, this is usually protected by the copyright laws. And this kind of copyright is owned by the, originally by the uh, operator of the AI tool. For example, OpenAI for ChatGPT. So the question is, can I use this stuff for my personal use? For example, uh, you want to write a poem uh, to your uh, dear loved husband or wife, uh, can I do it? Or for example, I, I, I asked the AI to write me a song, can I, can I put this song on my mobile phone and let my friends hear it because it's funny? Yeah, usually you can. You can use this kind of stuff for your personal use, usually. But you have to read the terms again. But can I use this stuff professionally? For example, if I run a news media outlet, for example, we have a TV show and I want to make uh, uh, a song for the TV show, can I ask AI tool to do it? Yeah, you can, but the question is, can I use it on the TV as well? Do I own the rights to use this song on professional grounds? And this depends on the terms and conditions of that specific AI tool. For example, if you look at the terms of mid-journey, you will find that you can use this stuff professionally only if you pay them, only if you use the paid subscription of the mid-journey program. For ChatGPT, it doesn't, uh, it, there is no difference. You can still use it. So it really, really depends on the AI tool. This is why you have to read the terms. 
Um, and there are also other rules what to keep in mind, but I will not go into them because we do not have enough time. And the fourth thing I want to tell you about today here is who is liable? Who is liable when uh, you know what hits the fan? Because um, it's always you. You are using the AI tool. And if you read those terms and conditions of the AI tool, then you find that they, they do not, they're not liable for anything, basically. You are the user of the AI tool. You should acknowledge that the AI tool can make mistakes. Uh, and that's it. So you are liable for wh whatever you use the AI tool. And you often find surprising liability caps from these terms and conditions. For example, if you read the ChatGPT terms and conditions, you will find that they are never liable for more than 100 US dollars. So for example, if you, if you are a programmer and you work with uh, AI tools to write the program, for example, with ChatGPT, uh, you're doing it as your employment task. And if something turns out is wrong with the program and somebody suffers a lot of damage, then ChatGPT is not liable for this stuff. You are. So, AI makes mistakes. Don't trust it completely. Again, kind of obvious thing to say, but it is as obvious as my recommendation to read the terms because surprising stuff may come out of there. And that's it. These were my four recommendations. Thank you very much. Uh, from my side here, uh, yeah, it, it works now. Good. Um, all right. Uh, so, a couple of questions also before I will leave you here in a stage with also with a panel discussion as well. Um, how worried are lawyers about AI taking their jobs? <laughs> um, I think it's it's it shouldn't be a worry. It should be more uh, of uh, using AI in our work, because. Um, uh, Working as a lawyer means that we have to go lots of documents at some stages of our work. For example, there is 100 pages of, of contract and your client is saying, uh, does it have any problems? What should I be wary of? If I put this contract into the AI, I will get the answer with one minute and the AI will tell me something. But what's the quality of that answer? That's the problem. So I think, it's, I think the question is not that AI will take our jobs, but how we can use AI to make our jobs easier, quicker, and perhaps even cheaper. My uh, like philosophical thinking here is that perhaps AI helps uh, law, uh, to bring law more to masses. Like more people can access legal services because it gets cheaper because lawyers are using AI. Uh -huh. Um, so a bit related question, uh, partly. <laughs> uh, how might AI change the landscape of courtroom arguments and legal defenses? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. Actually, what I have been seeing lately, uh, I actually saw it today morning, that uh, when we are drafting contracts and negotiating uh, with uh, counterparties of the agreement, I have myself, I have my client, and then we have the counterparty. And the counterparty does not have a lawyer, but the clauses provided with them, contract clauses, are so well written, like it's perfect English, but they do not understand the content because they use the AI for, for drafting it. So I think it, it, might, it might lead us to a point where people are using AI to, uh, to argue with each other, and then we end up like AI arguing with AI because AI oh, reads the arguments and drafts the arguments. So it's kind of, kind of funny thing. And that's like never-ending arguments in that Basically, way. Basically, right? yeah. And everything is in very polite English. Yeah. Well. <laughs> All right. But, uh, but thank you very much. And uh, I actually think that you can stay here on a stage, but I will ask your brother to come back on a stage. So, Rainer, uh, if you could take it over from my side here, and, and then I will leave you this uh, wonderful uh, thing as well, where you can see the questions from the uh, audience. So have a little fun with the panel discussion. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Lina and Janne. Uh, so this is a fun panel because uh, it starts like an anecdote. So three lawyers and one engineer are on the stage. And the rest, we will see uh, how it, and if it is funny. So uh, please take a seat and we already know a little bit about Henry, but uh, we don't know that much about you. So, uh, Janne, you are an associate professor in University of Oslo. 
So tell me about your research, and you are the engineer, aren't you? <coughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm the engineer. I, uh, at the University of Oslo, I work with security management, actually, within cybersecurity. Uh, but I have a very long career working on critical infrastructure protection, all the way back uh, to President Clinton and uh, his uh, uh, directive on critical infrastructure. So my background is uh, kind of multidisciplinary. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, and I uh, am also an economist and have a PhD in uh, information security back uh, to 2000. And Eight, nine, nine, yes. So uh, I've been working with uh, various uh, topics, uh, both for the government and uh, part-time uh, also in, uh, in the private sector. And now I'm uh, uh, at the University of Oslo teaching students, uh, Institute for Informatics. Uh, and I'm also, actually I have a full-time uh, full position at the Norwegian Water Research Sources and Energy Directorate, where I uh, do uh, development of uh, regulation and audits in, within the cybersecurity field. Thanks. Quite, quite something. Yeah. <laughs> really, really cool uh, to have you here in the panel. Uh, Lina, you are a, an advisor, legal advisor, and also a candidate for a PhD degree. What is your field of uh, studies and uh, research? Yeah, so uh, hello first, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, one thing is that daily I'm uh, working on, on domestic law, advising on, on how cybersecurity and law in Estonia works. However, my research is more focusing actually on international law. So doing my PhD studies and work at the university where I also teach international law, I how to say, I tried to figure out why states are doing what they are doing when it comes to uh, cyber security and cyber defense. So um, um, mainly my focus area is our sweet, sweet Eastern neighbor, meaning that I am trying to figure out why Russia is doing in the United Nations uh, when it, uh, what it does when it comes to regulating cyberspace uh, and states' behavior in cyberspace, as international law is a wee bit different when, uh, than uh, domestic law, meaning it is a bit more vague. It is created by the states who themselves have to actually enforce it. So it is quite a complicated area in that sense, and there is often this kind of... Um, idea that, you know, when it comes to cyber, it is totally, totally different. However, my point most likely will be that, you know, if we look more broadly uh, how things are in international law, we just have to apply it to cyber as well, and we can actually uh, pretty well uh, explain things. So this is one side, and on the other hand, I'm also trying to look at more on the individual side, meaning international criminal law, uh, and how that applies to cyberspace, meaning when cyber is used to conduct most heinous crimes, we're talking about war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, how then international law applies there. Really, really interesting. So when, when we would conclude, then your research is mostly about understanding what nations are doing on the field of cybersecurity and what Russia is trying to achieve in the regulation. Sort of, and, and how the law is actually made, and what are the differences, is, is there any specifics to cyber? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, one question right away to you, uh, Lina. Uh, when I mentioned uh, the question, perhaps we should uh, lower the bar of uh, criminal offenses and let, let the children get off the hook for criminal offenses in hacking, you made this a gorgeous face of no to me. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask, what gave me away? Was it the eyebrows? <laughs> um, yes and no. Um, no from the part if we think about creating like actual separate norms or new, uh, new criminal law norms, uh, saying that if you're underage, you're off the hook. In the sense that law in, in general I dare say, is sort of agnostic towards like who you are in the sense if you, if you step over the line, you step over the line. Of course, there are 
this certain uh, exceptions, as you brought out as well. And, you know, on the 14, you're not uh, capable of guilt. Uh, so on the 14, they are anyway out of it. And then there are very specific cases, I don't know, um, let's say the mother killing a newborn, very specific, but there is a very specific reason for it because, you know, childbirth is, uh, is uh, causing high emotional distress. So there is this very strong reasoning why have this specific exception. Now, being just underage, I dare say, is not comparable to that or does not justify that uh, in order to, or, uh, you know, to have this kind of uh, separate criminal law norm. However, the thing that you also brought out, and where I'd say yes, is what we do in the, um, in the limits of existing law, meaning that the criminal law doesn't say that if you hack, you go to jail. It gives much broader scale of what can be done. Uh, and the judge, the, the law enforcement can always take it into account, meaning that we can approach the adolescent uh, or the juvenile offenders in a different way, meaning taking into account that, oh, they were sort of experimenting. They actually didn't mean necessarily very much harm. And the example that you brought that, you know, uh, that the, the youngster was actually sent uh, to internship. Uh, I think it is one of the good examples, and that's the thing. The state prosecutor's office is actually doing it. They don't want, nobody wants uh, people to go to jail or have uh, as many criminals and offenders uh, with, the, with the criminal record as possible. Instead, we actually do want that, you know, if there is, you know, a hint of talent, uh, we want to use that. And the other thing is the, the idea of uh, restorative justice. Mm -hmm. If we can lead people to the right path, we should do it. Uh, but at the same time, the, the, the caveat here is that, you know, the consequences still should be in line with the harm caused. Meaning, regardless if you're 17 or 67, if you cause severe harm, there should be severe consequences. So, no, we shouldn't change the law. Yes, we should push for uh, reasonable sentencing and we should always look at what the person actually did. Yeah, uh, sentencing and, and the alternative options. So it wasn't that bad of a face after all. Okay, uh, question, uh, Jan. Uh, you published just this summer or last summer uh, a paper with your peers uh, where you analyzed uh, the practical impl Im like the practical perspective of uh, having those written security systems and the quality assurance systems and then uh, you were comparing what had actually been done mm. am i am i right uh, yes uh, we uh, we had uh, uh, data from uh, questionnaires on uh, security management, and uh, it was also, in addition, collected data through uh, various services, like, for instance, BitSight, that crawl the internet and can read uh, out the kind of uh, status from the uh, internet side on uh, how technical security is implemented. Uh, how good is your endpoint security? Have you secured emails? Uh, what kind of uh, protocols are used. Uh, and uh, we did a correlation uh, analysis, that which uh, showed that there were difficult to find any correlation between the two, uh, two uh, findings. So essentially, everybody sa said in the documentation, for example, that we use two-step verification, but in practice, when you tested it, there wasn't any. Yeah, but the question is not uh, correct uh, regarding to the data that we actually collected, but uh, uh, there is a huge distance between the conceptual and the operational. So while you can quite uh, specifically measure uh, what kind of algorithms you use, if you ask a human to, to answer a question, it's, it's not that uh, specific. So that's one problem. And another uh, challenge is that since we measured this uh, from the internet side, it says nothing about what the, what the status is uh, within uh, the companies. 
So, um, but uh, we, I also do audits. So, what I I can also confirm what you said that sometimes, not often, but sometimes, there are some uh, legacy systems or other systems in a huge uh, IT infrastructure that do not have two uh, uh, two factor authentication implemented. So the way to deal with this is to separate it from the internet. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, yeah, this you can makes it you can also. use another technical yeah. control to to mitigate that risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But actually, this leads me to a follow-up question. Uh, now, uh, do I understand correctly then that the, the issue is that sometimes the standard like ISO 27001 is uh, uh, followed to the letter? but the process of thinking has gone out of it. Yeah, well, you can, you can make a lot of uh, nice documents stating, uh, for instance, a security policy for the company. It should actually be reviewed. It should be communicated to the board and the management, but it, there is no time. So time is a scarce resource. We do not have uh, enough time to do all the good thing we should do when, the, when it comes to cybersecurity. There's a lack of personal, it's a lack of money, a lack of resources. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way to deal with this is named risk management. You have a budget, you have some resources, you, you do the risk management and you do the best as you can. Yeah, it's called uh, risk management, not risk exclusion for a reason. Yeah. So, uh, Jan, uh, if you allow me, I would uh, now lead us to, to the AI part of uh, the, these, uh, the, these uh, ethical questions. If, if we would talk about the wider scope of ethical issues with AI, uh, do you see as an engineer some wider issues there that we don't usually consider? Yes, I do. Uh, well, the main weakness are us, actually, because we trust this or... The less you know, the easier it is to trust something. Uh, because you don't know, you don't see all the, the risks. Um, it's also um, uh, about the data quality, where, uh, how it works, transparency, which has been mentioned. But uh, what has not been in much focus is the energy usage. So I read in, uh, I think it was Brussels Times, uh, 12th of May, that uh, a, sim uh, a chat GPT-3 search uh, used 25 times as much uh, energy as a regular Google search. So um, this is uh, not in line with the United Nations uh, sustainability objectives. And also, when it comes to water usage, uh, 20 to 50 queries, there are studies that document that, uh, use uh, about a half bottle of uh, water. And fresh water is a scarce uh, resource on Earth. So we have actually quite a wider perspective to look at uh, energy, water, but uh, the biggest weakness is the person, the user themselves. Yeah, because we are driving the uh, uh, usage with, without thinking about the consequences. Uh, we always, we, we love to design new uh, software and uh, new things, but um, uh, when you do innovation, you do not, uh, you don't, do not think about what are the uh, bad side of what you're doing, uh, or are there any uh, side effects that you should actually omit or handle in some way? Mm -hmm. Thank you. About the human uh, using the machine, Henry, a uh, question to you, like, s you partially touched upon this topic, but I'm going to poke a little bit more. So, uh, you said, read the terms but these documents are 20, 10, 20 pages long. Would you trust the AI to read the terms and uh, make a summary for yourself? 
Uh, yeah, that's a very good question because I, I don't really believe that anyone bothers to read them. And uh, <laughs> myself, I don't also much want to read them if I'm not doing anything serious. But uh, my recommendation here, it, it's a fact that if you would put a whatever contract or if you would put ChatGPT's terms into ChatGPT and tell ChatGPT, dear ChatGPT, uh, red flag to me the most serious parts of it or which are the most risk riskiest, then it will do it. But uh, there is a conflict of interest because ChatGPT is reading its own terms. So if I would do it, I would recommend to use another AI tool to do it. <laughs> so don't let the same AI tool read your terms, which terms you are trying to read, because then you do not have the conflict of interest behind it. So conflict of interest. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't trust it completely. For ex Of course, if you're doing it for your personal stuff, then, it's, then, then the risk is, is not really high. But if you are taking a company-wide decision that now we are starting to use this AI tool for that stuff, and if anything goes wrong, we are uh, in, in, in a bad situation, then I would really advise to read it yourself. Or include the legal team, of course. Then you can you know, get some quality results from, getting, uh, from reading it. Thank you. Lena, what do you, Lena has a... Yeah, I would actually, regarding trust, I have a, um, a bit different example, but the, the thing that do you trust the results of, for example, ChatGPT or whatever, or, uh, some, uh, some other uh, version uh, in academic work. Uh, I have tried, I think at least twice, maybe even more, to ask uh, ChatGPT that, you know, give me a list of 10 best articles in topic X for example, and then it generates me an answer. It really looks like, you know, hmm, this author, yeah, I think I have heard that name and this uh, title, it sounds like really relevant to this topic. And then when you go to the actual databases and it even provides you like journals and publishing time and everything, when you actually go to look for those, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are just taken possible uh, names even some are made up, but they sound very similar to the existing names, and it is created. So it's a language model. Sounds mm -hmm. like a like the Estonian site Telegram.de. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, you want yeah, well, to add something? Yeah, uh, well, what uh, I'm going back to the competences because what what's the what's the problem here? The problem is that we don't understand how Chat D GPT works. It's actually just statistics. It's picking text which statistically fits together, it's impossible to search the whole internet, so it has to do some choices. Uh, my husband, he's a chief engineer on a ship, and uh, he, we made a test. His neighbor, he was good at uh, using ChatGPT, so he uh, asked ChatGPT to make a manual, technical manual for the engine. It was useless. It was just the same as you, uh, you said. So. Uh, uh, the, when we start to use uh, services and products that we actually do not s understand how they operate or how, how they come to the conclusion, it might have really serious consequences. And you can imagine if this was used within uh, medical services or within critical infrastructure, could mm -hmm. be serious consequences. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this actually, uh, these are very relevant problems, and these are actually the problems that the new European Union AI Act is trying to figure out. It says that some AI systems will be high-risk systems, for example, systems used in, in medical field or in critical infrastructure, and there will be you know, lots of obligations for the developers of these kind of systems, and some obligations also for the users of these systems to... Uh, not to ensure fully, but how to mitigate these problems that we have with AI. And it also, it also addresses the question of the black box problem. You know, AI is like a bowl of soup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a black box and, and for example, ChatGPT uh, will have an obligation uh, to have a transparency policy. 
to explain uh, why it does what it does and also have a copyright policy so it wouldn't just uh, uh, wouldn't just copy stuff in all places of the internet and uh, then infringe those IP rights. Mm. Mm -hmm. But let's bring this uh, this discussion to a next level and let's escalate. Right now, the problem seems to be a good problem, namely that uh, the AI is stupid, uh, not able to fully do its work. Uh, but let's imagine that we are in the territory of uh, Skynet in, uh, in the movie, Terminator movies and uh, the AI has become self-aware and making decisions and so forth. Lena, uh, what do you think from, from the perspective of international law specifically, uh, would you see then see the system in a way that the AI becomes a separate uh, like entity in the legal system, like a separate agent or, or not, not no longer simply under one state, but something different? Mm -hmm. I must say, uh, Reiner gave us the caveat that we should not fall into deep legal discussions, and now he's ah, setting ah, up ah. a total rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, but I will uh, keep my dis distance from that rabbit hole. Um, one thing is that, you know, law, in, including international law, it is created by humans and, after all, for humans. States are also consisting of physical people uh, behind them making decisions, even though we say state responsibility, are still, uh, are still people. Uh, so you have the possibility to actually enforce it somehow. So the question is, uh, for me, wh where I started, uh, how to say, uh, lean towards is the, is the question of like responsibility. Uh, and can, could we, in that case, actually enforce it somehow towards that uh, actual disruptive, uh, full artificial intelligence. Um, and that leads to the question of like, okay, we can give it some rights, some obligations, maybe it's capable of like fulfilling those, but then it's, does it have the sense of fear of punishment? And how could we punish? Okay, let's imagine termination. Does it fear termination in that sense? If it would, then, you know, maybe, like, more broadly, I would say that perhaps it could be an actor anti international law because we have created other actors than states uh, under international law, international organizations, uh, legal, uh, legal persons have some kind of status. Um, so it would be possible because, you know, basically, law is a language and we can describe anything with a language, right? Uh, however, the thing is, is it effective? and what do we gain from it? Well put, well put. Uh, to say, to, to continue on that front of escalation, Jan, uh, you as an engineer, uh, how do you see it? This is perhaps a <laughs> theological question even. So if uh, the humankind created AI, then the humankind is kind of a god to the AI. But what do you think if we have a self-aware AI, does it agree with the laws written by men? Does it have to? Well, there is a very simple solution to get rid of the AI, and that's the power outage. <laughs> it doesn't work without power. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, if you compare the human brain, and uh, you have a, a picture with a uh, number two, gray, white, uh, uh, black colors, uh, you, in a, a second or less, you can read that this is number two. If you use machine learning, it's to over over thousand, thousand uh, parameters that should be calculated. So when you look into a generative I, uh, AI uh, that I interpret, we are actually talking about here, not machine learning, which is simpler, easier to, to control. Uh, it is a huge amount of energy usage needed to calculate. And um, it's, oh, another point is that what, what kind of data is used? It is the historical data, data that already exists, right? It's not, it's not the creativity that lay, lays in the future. 
uh, it has also um, uh, it does not uh, also take into account outliers. It's statistics it, that it builds on so far. It's the, it's computer co processing. It was enabled by uh, the higher uh, internet capacity, broadband, and also the processor uh, capacity. That enabled us to, 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 to do a, a huge data uh, analysis that provides us with information. So I really don't believe in uh, AI outcompeting the humans, but of course, if we leave more and more of what we actually think and do, we might become stu more stupid. I don't know. <laughs> That's the, actually the way I see it as well. Uh, I get the question about uh, will, uh, will uh, law lawyers be substituted by AI soon, any soon? My answer usually is uh, AI will make lawyers stronger, but I guess it's with, with anything. Uh, if uh, used correctly, it will make you better, but yet at the end of the day, today and 20 years from now, it will still be a tool. Yeah. Uh, but uh, let's uh, make the line. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you mentioned something very important. AI is useful uh, for uh, purposes which is meant to be used for. Uh, if you think that you can use it for anything, it's it's the wrong concept. Mm, I agree with you. Uh, and to give Henry also the chance with the escalation of a self-aware AI. Uh, Henry, say you are negotiating a contract with a self-aware uh, AI and you agree on something, you shake hands with AI on something. What do you think, do you uh, believe that the self-aware AI also believes in the principle that a contract should be honored? Um, it's a tricky question because when AI would be just like a lines of zeros and ones and we would do whatever a human has told it to do, like a regular computer program, then most likely it would follow the principle that contracts should be fulfilled. But uh, if AI is generative and AI is learning from what is going on in the world, then the AI will also understand that it's, uh, you know, it's quite okay to infringe a contract once in a while. You will go to the court and, you know, it will take time and sometimes contracts um, are infringed. So I think, it will, I think it will infringe a contract if it thinks it's the best outcome. And maybe it's even the strategy of that AI, software AI, AI to agree on that contract and agree on those clauses. And maybe the AI already knows that it will infringe it. I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a mystified world. So you would trust it as much as any other human being you don't know? In a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you. So we have uh, one uh, question which is quite hard and I guess uh, it will be directed at Lina. So according to uh, uh, international law, what offensive uh, cyber tools uh, can we build to build a deterrence against uh, Russia, China, and Iran? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> well, in broad sense, the logic is that there is the Mortens Clause. So basically it says, uh, in, in simple terms, is that, you know, regardless of the means that we are using, we ought to still apply the same rules that we have and follow still in case of, for example, international humanitarian law, which, which becomes uh, relevant when we talk about the, the context of, uh, of armed conflict. Um, so regardless of, of like whether we are using knives and, and forks, uh, automated weapons or cyber means, we still ought to follow uh, the same principles uh, of warfare. We still have to allocate those rules to uh, uh, then um, uh, weapons control treaties, if there are such in place, uh, and the assessment of weapons, whether they are acceptable under international law. So in principle, weapons have to go through certain assessment. Of course, it is a bit open to discussion, how do we apply it to, to cyber means, but in principle, we actually have those. I don't have the answer, like what kind of specific. The, rather, the point is that whatever we create, 
we have to assess whether they are ethical under international law rules that already exist. We have to go through that assessment. For example, they should uh, not be indiscriminative, meaning that you, know, you have to be able to actually attack specific targets, but not everyone in the room or in the area, for example. So we should be creative, but we should follow the rules. Yeah. Good. Uh, the time is now zero, 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 zero. So thank you very much, uh, Jan, Elina, and Henry. Uh, was a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I will take it over with some uh, good news. Uh, we're going to have now a little coffee break. So you have around 15 minutes. We're going to be here, uh, 45, back here in 45. Uh, and uh, yeah, so just go, go get some energy from coffee or tea. And uh, we will be meeting here uh, 45 minutes past uh, two. Yes, that's correct. All right, see you very soon. All right, welcome back everybody. We are about to start the last part of our uh, our conference today. And, and for this, I am extremely happy uh, to invite on the stage uh, Linda mostrup Bederson, who is the founding partner at uh, Happy42. I really love the name, Happy42. Uh, so she's going to talk about building a collaborative uh, cybersecurity skills ecosystem in the Nordic Baltic region. So Linda, happy to welcome you here on the stage. Thank you very much and a very warm welcome to all of you listening in, both here and uh, online. In the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to present you about our work with our cyber skills uh, think tank, why we did it, how it has went uh, in the last year and what we're going to continue to work with in uh, 2025. After that, we'll jump directly into the panel discussion where we have invited four of our uh, members from the think tank, where we'll discuss some of the essential issues that have been, been discussed a lot in our think tank. But the first question is, why did we establish a think tank? Um, from a personal note, uh, again, my name is Linda and have been a partner in a company for the last 10 years, uh, working with talent development in tech and within security for the last seven years. I live in Denmark. Uh, it's a rather small uh, cybersecurity community and a lot of the people working with, let's say, education and skilling, we know each other. And the people who are uh, really good in some very um, technical topics, their time is limited. So a lot of the times when we are talking about what are good initiatives to launch, what educational material do we need, um, how should educational programs for the future look like, instead of reinventing, uh, what do you say, the, the wheel, we might as well look across borders and be inspired of our neighbor countries. So it was a very personal um, ambition that a wish to collaborate more across borders. So, luckily for us, uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers uh, agreed on that uh, mission and decided to uh, finance a, a pilot in 2024, where we said, okay, we're going to launch this think tank with members from uh, across the Nordic and Baltic countries. Then you could say, looking into cybersecurity, and I think we discussed it a lot today with, with the previous speakers, that uh, looking into education, it's a very conservative area. Uh, taking new choices about educational programs takes a lot of time, but we don't have that time when we're dealing with cybersecurity. We have, can have very good policies on a long-term perspective, but we also need to do something today, and preferably we already did it yesterday. So we need some hands-on initiatives, and that was why our focus was, when recruiting the members for the think tank, it needed to be practitioners, people who had their uh, hands dirty and actually developed programs, tested it, met the students, met the young people, met the people actually applying these skills. So, that was the background for actually initiating the think tank. 
The think tank has its cornerstone in, in Aarhus, uh, based in Denmark. So it's the municipality of Aarhus who is uh, behind, together with the Nordic Council of Ministers. Then are we um, the operator, together with security's tech space. So my ambition is that when you leave this room, you have found Cyber Bridge Forum on LinkedIn and uh, chose to uh, follow our page. So you can actually follow the recommendation that we're doing this year and also next year. But what have we done? And I think it's, it's uh, interesting for you to actually get some insights into how we have done the, the operating model. Um, we recruited 40 members uh, representing all of the Nordic and Baltic countries. Of course, we could identify good names, but we also asked our good colleagues in the countries who are the right people to invite. And we succeeded on gathering a, a quite good group. I will get to that uh, in a minute. Then we decided to say, okay, we need to establish a relationship between these members before we actually uh, get them together in person. So we had around nine uh, task force meetings in the first six months of 2024. And yes, you can do a lot online, having good meetings and discussing, but the real relationship building happens when you meet in person. So we gathered all of them in Aarhus in August. Uh, all of them traveled all the way to Aarhus, which is not the re easiest route, but we really saw that having them in person and they kind of knew each other and beforehand, then the magic happens because then we have a relationship that we can build on and the real ideas and uh, perspective um, was brought to the table. So the members, and I know some of you are sitting here today, uh, we, we are very proud of the group because it's a combination of both uh, from the private sector, uh, educational sector, uh, public institutions, the defense, uh, etc. And also we have youth representatives uh, below 20 years old, so we have the, the voice of the youth as well in it. So the fact that we have all these different profiles from different sectors also brings some, some new perspectives um, that we can't solve problems with the mindset that created the problem. So we need to have these diverse groups and I think we succeeded with it. And also what is common for these 40 people is that they are really passionate about making a difference. And I think if you in the audience, if you work with cybersecurity on a daily basis, you'll probably also agree that it's probably the most um, an open-minded community where people are really willing to help each other, uh, willing to contribute, because it's a bit of a passion and paranoia, because when you know how the threat landscape is, you also know that we need to do something about it today. So that is why uh, we have 40 members who said we want to invest our time, we want to invest our knowledge if we can make a difference in terms of closing this cyber uh, security skilling gap that we have in all of the countries. But what is important here is that it's anchored under the Nordic Council of Ministers. And I actually want to stress the importance that it's anchored under them. Because the members are also saying, well, we have a lot of groups where we contribute with good ideas and perspective. But what really matters to us is that we can bring it to the table for policymakers, actually make those differences on the long term. So it makes a, a tremendous difference for us that is organized in the way it is. Um, yes. And then in terms of the strength of the think tank, that we're putting together a diverse group of people. It's no secret that it also creates challenges because it's very hard to, to kind of find the path uh, when we're having the discussions because we have different interests. We have different stakeholders that we are uh, putting our attention to. But the, at the end of the day, when we're having these discussions, we also get the broad perspectives. People having different experiences from different backgrounds. We get a mix of ideas on what is really needed in the given countries, and we get more credibility and trust in terms of what is actually being suggested. So we wouldn't change it in terms of how the group is formed because we can really see that it creates uh, a lot of value. Then, okay, I want to skip back here. We were discussing, okay, how is the landscape in the respective countries? Is it the same challenges that we're facing? And I must admit that, surprisingly enough, it is the same challenges that we're facing in all of the countries. It has been on the headline for many years now, but it didn't really change a lot. So educational programs, even though we have heard also today that uh, policymakers are prioritizing building better educational programs, it's a long, long way. Um, you're not just changing uh, curriculums on universities, gymnasiums, etc. at least not in Denmark. So that is 
again, it's very important, but it's not fixing anything within this year. Um, so we need to talk together about how are we, can we be inspired by our, our neighbor countries and how they are developing curriculums. Um, as Gona told you uh, earlier in the morning, how they have built more flexible programs, uh, equipping people with skills in cybersecurity, etc. So being inspired by existing programs is quite important for us. Therefore, educational programs was a headline that we needed to address. Then diversity. I think it's no uh, surprise for any of you that we are lacking, especially females within the field of cybersecurity. I think we can visit uh, the hall next to us and count the numbers uh, in terms of how many females, and I don't think it's a 50-50 split. Unfortunately, that's also the case in all of our countries. It's hard for us to attract the girls, it's hard for us to maintain them, uh, especially in the technical domain, and again, it goes across all of the countries. So even though we can see that we have really good pilots, let's say in Estonia, I know Tina, who will come on stage later, you have been the front runner for some very good initiatives attracting more females. But pilots can't stand alone. Like we need to build sustainable initiatives and maybe even here also take programs across borders instead of again building our own small uh, silos in the given countries because it's a challenge that we need to address all of us. Then. <clears throat> we need to attract more young profiles to the field. So yes, for us in this room, uh, probably a lot of you is, is hyped about cybersecurity. That is why you're here. That is why you're attending this conference. But even though we have a hype about it, it's not necessarily the same reality in the schools uh, when they're choosing their uh, career path for their whole life, because we're competing with a lot of other technical domains. So I can say in, in Denmark, yes, we can feel that we're offering the best programs ever, but we are uh, competing with AI specialties, uh, coding programs, etc. So again, it's being a very niche uh, area where we need to see how can we do it even more attractive for young people to choose this field. Then all of us also uh, had the same challenge about building effective collaboration between academia and industry. Um, academia is a fantastic world of passionate people doing very, very uh, valuable research. But when we're talking about cybersecurity, we also have a threat landscape that is different today than it was yesterday. So it requires um, a lot of sync between the industry and academia if we need to develop up-to-date uh, uh, cases, curriculum, etc., equipping the students with skills that they can use when they're attending uh, their job when they're finished with the universities. Then, in the last year, uh, with all of the members that we had, we also tried to identify what have you done in the different countries that really created value. So we developed 15 uh, best practice cases that you can read on the website as well, if you're curious, where you can see different examples on how the different countries have worked really good with programs. So for an example, in Denmark, um, we are leading an initiative called uh, the Danish Championships, which is a really, really big competition leading up to selecting the national team competing at the European Championships. And I think that model have inspired a lot of our neighbor countries to do the same. Because what they can see is that we have a, a tunnel funnel of approximately maybe 2,000 young people in Denmark competing during the whole year before we selecting the final 10. So we hope that all these cases can inspire other countries to say, should we implement something similar? And who can we contact for further information if we want to knowledge share about how they have done it? Then uh, we luckily uh, got the opportunity to get finance for 2025 for the think tank. So it uh, has been a possibility to continue with it. So it was really great news that uh, the Nordic Council ministers supported that mission. But what is important for the next year is that it must not just be a copy of this year. This year, we build trust and relationship among our members because that is the foundation for actually being able to knowledge share honestly and maybe even make collaboration across the countries that will be a, a reality in, in, um, in activities. So what we're going to do is 
what we learned this year was, okay, what are the uh, common challenges and what specific work stream should we focus at in 2025? And then we will try to make a more design task force group as addressing very specific challenges. So I hope when you follow our LinkedIn page, you'll be able in the next year to actually see what strategies and recommendation are our members actually developing based on the premise that we are facing the same challenges. So what we're going to have in focus and what they will be trying to address is, first of all, how can we share resources and teaching material across the universities? Because all of the members within these, uh, this area had a very clear wish that if we could, please share our materials. If it's open source, if it's allowed, it would create tremendous value if Gunnar in Sweden could make use of Christian's teaching material in Denmark and so forward. So we're trying to see if we can develop a structure for this. So if anyone sitting in the room who is also from a university, educational institutions, try to be in the loop so you also can get access to this. Then we'll try to develop some recommendations for how to build and structure up-to-date uh, cyber cases for students. Because as I said earlier, the threat landscape is changing every day. So we really need to find a format and also teach the industry how do we develop the best cases that actually reflects uh, real life challenges. Then we're digging into um, incorporating cybersecurity on non-technical educations. Again, if we're looking to the health sector, well, cybersecurity is indeed important for the um, employees in this sector to know about. The nurses need to know about critical system and how uh, to have a healthy cyber hygiene uh, when we're talking about phishing mails, passwords, etc. So cyber security must not be isolated to the specialist alone. We need to broaden it up and get it into the non-technical uh, and also non-security educational programs. So we need to find out what is a a good way for this and can we learn from each other. Then we try to see how we can utilize the successful programs that is already being carried out for young people. So let's say the initiatives that you have in Estonia, can we roll it out in the Scandinavian countries, etc.? Can we use the knowledge that have been uh, produced uh, in each of the countries? Then we'll try to see how we can foster better partnership between industry and academia. It's a hard nut to crack for everyone. Uh, the industry is operating in one pace uh, and academia in another, and they need to find each other. And especially in cybersecurity, we have some challenges also in terms of uh, what are companies willing to disclose um, and how to build the right format for this. And then lastly, we want to establish a closer cooperation with NISA to see how can they uh, may take advantage of our input and reflections and how can we also leverage and promote all of the good publication and knowledge that NISA is producing. So if you follow our work, you will see uh, concrete action on these different topics. Then next week, we will uh, publish an end of year report where you can read a summary of our work and uh, what we have found out so far. So that was basically it. And my timer said zero, zero, zero. So it uh, fits perfectly, which means that I would like to jump directly into our panel discussion. Because what is interesting here is not what I'm talking about. It is what is our members is thinking about the different topics. So I would like to invite Gona, Janne, Tina, and Lars up on stage, and then uh, let's continue with the panel discussion. Yes. So we already had a pre-meeting, because as you know, we know each other. So I also said to you guys that this is like a, a get-together since we met in August. So we won't be that formal as the previous panel discussion have been. And maybe I will stop you if your answer is too long, because we want to uh, take advantage of the minutes that we're having. I know all of you have been speaking, uh, except you, Tina. But I would like a, a very brief introduction by each of you, uh, who you are, your role, and then what you want to change within this domain when we're talking about the think tank? Like, what is close to your heart? Because I know you have different uh, passion regarding this. So let's start with you, Lars. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lars Blomgaard, and uh, I'm from Denmark. I uh, am working in Dubix as a private security company right now. 
previously have been in the, the Danish police, where I did uh, digital investigation and, and forensics in regards to all the cybercrime that we see. And in my spare time, I educate um, all newcomers to the field uh, at Copenhagen Business Academy. Um, what I would love to see brought to the field here is actually actionable um, material that you can bring directly home and work with, more or less, out of the, the box. So I would, um, I would love to see that uh, contribution. Yes, thank you yeah. very much, Lars. Gunnar Karlsson. I'm uh, here from uh, Cyber Campus Sweden, which is a national organization to get um, uh, public and, and commercial sector and uh, civil society together, uh, increasing uh, cybersecurity with respect to research, innovation, and education. And I'm leading the educational activities. And uh, close to my heart, or at least close to my worries, uh, uh, is what I'm working on currently, which is to get uh, actual needs for education stated by uh, companies and state agencies. Um, how, because universities can respond to, uh, to the needs, but they have to be stated for us. They have to be articulated. And uh, this is in remarkably difficult to get hold of. So that is near to me. Yes. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Janne Hagen from uh, the University of Oslo. I'm an associate professor there, teaching uh, uh, cybersecurity risk uh, management. Um, I also have a long career in critical infrastructure protection, and uh, uh, my uh, main concern is actually uh, the vocational education, because uh, if we're going to recruit more skilled uh, cybersecurity experts, we need to broaden the, the baseline of recruitment. And uh, these people also uh, uh, various positions, uh, and they actually need that kind of competences in their jobs. Yes, thank you very much. And Tina? Hi, my name is Tina. I'm working uh, for Information System Authority, RIA, uh, in Estonia, and I'm expert coordinator. And I'm working on cybersecurity skills topic. And yeah, I'm working it on different levels, uh, uh -huh. like making uh, uh -huh. events for youth, so make them excited about cybersecurity, organizing trainings for teachers, uh, doing cooperation with universities, oh, so on and so okay. on. And what's closest to my heart or, is that I do see uh, that uh, young people doesn't know about career in cybersecurity. Therefore, they are not taking any actions coming here. Uh, some of them know, but there's this small portion of youth. And many of them are not ending up here because they have no idea about it. Uh, so I would like to face the situation that young people say like, hey, I don't want to go to cybersecurity because they know what it is. And therefore, we would have more people saying, hey, I like cybersecurity and I will plan my studies or I will plan my after school activities or I will uh, change my career towards uh, cybersecurity. But I wanted to be the way that more people make it as a choice not as life happens. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Tina. And then I also uh, got the uh, acceptance that I'm both a moderator but also an active contributor in this panel <laughs> because I'm in it together with you. So close to my heart is that we need to change the narrative about what cybersecurity is. I love the people sitting in here with the cyber battle, but we need to show the society that cybersecurity is much more than the work into the computer. So it goes both into the educational programs, but also in the corporations, telling them cybersecurity is living in all of the units, not only in the security department. So that's very close to my heart. So we have four topics that we're going to cover in uh, 32 minutes. So we have eight minutes to each. So again, we'll try to see if everybody can, can contribute. Um, the first topic is how you think that we will uh, succeed with uh, effectively collaborating across borders. Like, what are the, the key factors for success if, if we're going to succeed with these type of initiatives? I don't know if any one of you want to, to start. What do you think will be important in our work ahead? Um, yeah, I would yes. love to start with that one. Um, actually, what I think would be a beneficial thing is that if I want to go from Denmark to Estonia to study some kind of topic, these points that I can earn here in Estonia, I cannot take them back to Denmark necessarily. 
because that if I have to do that, then it has to be evaluated in the Danish uh, educational system in order to bring these uh, um, points back. So if we can have like an equal level of knowledge, an equal level of, of um, education to say, okay, we can transfer that back and forth. And that should be possible for our politicians to have that kind of level defined. So that, that if we can have that, we have gone a long way. And I know you're a very strong advocate for that, Lars. So yes. I know that we're going to at least <laughs> succeed with pushing some doors. Yes, Connor. <clears throat> Uh, we are fortunate that these countries that are collaborating are very similar in many respects. Highly digitalized, uh, well-functioning education sector and so forth. So I think um, sharing experience is meaningful. Um, sharing with countries which are very different uh, experiences are not necessarily meaningful, but here they are. And um, I, th I think we, we, we basically have to get started on that. I, I, I think the, the, the thresholds uh, are exists like 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 a credit transfer and so forth but uh, uh, mostly is the, the the mechanisms and the and the procedures for doing it um, so i think for instance uh, could we compile uh, what i said uh, lists of, of uh, needs for courses and training opportunities in sweden they're probably quite similar to uh, opportunities in, in denmark or if so sharing that intelligence data which is very difficult to get by uh, today would be a very good start Yes. Yes, um, I think that uh, um, having a more uh, use of guest lecturing from the other Nordic countries, it's uh, you cannot underestimate what personal relations means to collaboration when when it comes to the practical side. So, uh, using more uh, uh, guest lecturing from various uh, Nordic countries, and uh, it should actually not be a problem when you can have the. Uh, speech on Zoom, or you can meet virtually. So that's one one yeah. example. Yeah. I think it's really important, like this uh, format as well, as think tank, that we get to know people on other countries who to call as if you want to have quest lecture or so on, and other formats as well, like uh, let's put together specialists who are working similar things in different countries together. Another format for another kind of specialists to have them. For example, we just issued as RIA uh, one booklet for schools, which was actually developed in Finland. But our experts were having a meeting together with experts in Finland and they showed that and they were like, oh, that's really good. We want to have this in Estonia as well. So this material was translated and this is something that we don't have to do everything. Every work doesn't have to be made in a way that everyone is inventing the wheel, but we can share what we have done. And maybe you help out with this one, and we can help you out with this one. And I was part of the European cybersecurity competition uh, last month in uh, Italy. And it was really nice to see that actually those people who are putting te together the national teams are actually working together as well. Hey, we are making a qualification round for our country. If you want, you can join, like send 20, 30 people from your country as well. It can be training for them. Like, let's be open for different kind of opportunities and be like uh, friends who are sharing uh, what they have with each other. So I think you're addressing the very uh, critical part is that we need to knowledge share with friends, people we know, people we trust. But why is that so difficult? Why haven't it happened yet? What, what, what is the biggest obstacle for, for actually realizing this? I know that we're starting on it, but... Yeah, hmm. I, I, don't, I don't see um, any uh, major obstacles. Uh, there will be practicalities, but... I think the motivation has not been there before. So I think uh, starting from the motivation now to do something, um, but I, I, I cannot imagine any, any major difficulties. I actually have, I can share my personal experience. I, uh, my background is in the field of education. So I used to work in schools, in Ministry of Education and doing other, other stuff in the field of, of education. So when I came to work the position I'm working currently, I didn't have any connections in cybersecurity domain. So it was really difficult for me the like first half a year to like call people like, hey, I'm doing this, uh, can we meet up or so? But uh, during these two and a half years, I have built a community where I feel comfortable like calling people. And so maybe it's uh, 
helps if uh, you are a new people in the domain and somebody calls you and tells you like, hey, we have a good connection there, let's go together. So if you have a new colleague or somebody who doesn't have this community yet, it helps if you are uh, taking their hand and uh, bringing them to the places and showing them to people. Luckily, I had this team who helped me a lot, but this might be as well if we are talking about this, uh, we need this personal contacts who can help us so that we can share our community with the ones who are yet starting in this field. Mm -hmm. And now, Gona, you said you think the motivation is here now. What have happened since it's there now? Has there anything societal? Yeah, a sense of urgency that, mm. that uh, we have problems to face up to. I think it's simply that. Also, with political recognition of that, at least in Sweden, um, I mean, uh, we, we, Sweden was supposed to be neutral until uh, two months after uh, uh, the, the Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, and then now we're a NATO member, which was unforeseen for for, for since the, since ever. So um, so things change very rapidly um, when, when when the sense of urgency comes, mm -hmm. and I think uh, we are fortunate in this field. There are other fields, perhaps, where where they cannot. Uh, point to, to stronger motivation, but, but in our field we can, and I think uh, we, should, we should use that. We have to meet up to the expectations also, because motivation is also uh, follows by a lot of expectation on us to deliver something. Yes, agree. And Jenny? Uh, I think that when it comes to the universities, there are already funding schemes and uh, established relations across uh, Nordic and Baltic uh, countries. But when, when, you, when you look into vocational education, and uh, remember that, uh, for instance, Norway is not that big country, actually, 5.5 millions, but the population is spread all the way over the country and in the uh, r rural uh, areas. Uh, they uh, maybe have mo most uh, employees coming from the vocational education. So. Uh, there is no funding schemas uh, that actually enables that kind of uh, collaboration. Uh, also, when it comes to uh, teacher reserves, when uh, when uh, somebody is leaving the job for a, a temporary uh, time, so uh, th that's where uh, I think uh, we should also uh, focus on the education. There is a lot of young people that actually do not go to the university. Yes, and I know we also discussed it in August, the thing with, if we're going, all of the members together, uh, and all of us with the voice saying, like, we need better structures also for funding, for educational material across countries, uh, maybe we can talk a bit louder. Uh, and I think all, some of you also said the thing that we are anchored under the Nordic Council of Ministers. Hopefully we can make a positive impact here. Yes. And then if we take the second part, uh, we have talked a lot about the industry partnerships. That when we're talking about cybersecurity, it's all about fixing challenges in the real world. We're talking about a threat landscape that is changing every day. We need to have a partnership with the industry so we are understanding what is happening there. Could you give some insights to the audience on what challenges are there now uh, in terms of su successful uh, partnership with the industry and what would be the ambition for the future? Like, How can we fix it? I know it's not an easy one to fix, mm -hmm. but... If I may start yes. on that, um, I know that we have in Denmark the initiative called CyberSkills, where we can get all the young people to meet the companies out there. And the thing I personally encountered is that there's a lot of questions from the youngsters that when they arrive in the cybersecurity industry, they have a lot of questions in order to what and how do we fit into to this picture. And then if they should be part of that, then we as old timers should also invite these young people in to say, okay, what are the requirements that we see as, as long as you got the, um, the desire and um, a, a good team player, then you're also set to go. Because if, if they have that, then we in, in the security industry and also in the private sector can build uh, realism into the classrooms. And that is also what you said, that there lacks some kind of realism. Because uh, all the young people, they don't know what they are working with. You can go into a lot of these different websites and, and learn different things but you cannot put the puzzles together. So I think that is what we can uh, contribute with. And we have seen, um, I would say, several successful uh, collaborations in, in Denmark, at least, because we have helped in, in that sense. 
Yes, and Gordon? Um, I also uh, think that we have to put uh, demands on the, on the industry side and also public agencies which are hiring in this area. Um, they have to understand that, that the skills shortage will not be solved by uh, increasing undergraduate and graduate programs. Uh, in Sweden, we have expanded a lot, and, and it's mainly shortage of applicants at this point. Also, um, the throughput is not great. About half of the students enrolling uh, do not graduate. Um, they may be skilled enough to get a job, but when companies say you need a master's degree and five years work experience, mm -hmm. and they're not providing that work experience, I mean, they are creating their own skill shortage also. Uh, they have to provide training opportunities. They have to see that people can be skilled without having a, a degree. Um, so, um, and at, at university, we, we can provide tests. I mean, we have examination for everything. So, so we could put them up as tests. If they, if they have uh, someone who, who has uh, dropped out of, of, uh, of education and they want to, to vet that person, well, come to university and, and, and get the test for, for that, that particular person, right? You have to pay for it, but, but uh, money is usually not the problem. So, so that, uh, they, they have to be realistic and they also to, to contribute something in order to get this, this skills addressed. And in some areas, not even engineering, is, is, uh, which is, is, is undersupplied, is maybe necessarily background. Maybe people from social sciences trained, as, as uh, Janne said, in, with, with the professional training, which could be a semester or a year of, of cybersecurity, might, might bring them the best expertise for the areas they have. So. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, which, which is, is, is very close to, to the problems I'm, I'm working with, uh, they have to also to articulate their demands. If they need professional training for their staff, what is that? You cannot just say cybersecurity, because that's a, just a field, that's not a, a course title. And when you get down to, 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 to levels, you have to say, for what category, what background do they have, uh, how much volume, how much work time will they put aside? Is, right? but, but now you need, or are you saying we need to put pressure, but is it because the companies are lacking the knowledge on being able to specify it? Yes, but, but, but in that case, there has, they can initiate, I mean, they have to do the ground. What are the work tasks that they cannot staff, right? If you work from the tasks forward, you can probably see what type of, of, of skill set you need in a person. Uh, we cannot do that for them. I mean, and everyone has to recognize we have an uh, economy to deal with at universities also, and these are products, courses are our products, and you cannot blindly develop products for a market where the market is undefined as it is right now. Mm. So, so, so industry also have to step up. We, we can do a lot of things, but, but, but there has to be a counterpart also that, that uh, comes with their information to us. Mm. But maybe just before you, uh, Tina and Janet, to stick to the question, and I can ask you last because you're representing the industry. I think we're experienced companies who do not know what is the cybersecurity profile working with. So we mm. see job positions yep, yep. where they need to handle government risk and compliance yep. while yep. being a pen tester. And I yep. think people in the industry will know yep. that is not yep. doable. Yep. So what is your, from an industry perspective, do we need to train companies as well or? Yes. Uh, I mean, they have to be a little bit more clear in, in what they actually need mm -hmm. because that's, that's the problem. And uh, one of the things I've also encountered myself is that uh, if, if the companies out there, they want to have different skill set, they have to define it and be very specific because then they can feed that back to the universities and say, okay, what do we need to acquire in, in, in the future? But again, there are, it's important to understand there are different levels of uh, the, uh, the needs out there in, the co in businesses, mm -hmm. especially in Denmark where the diversity of, of uh, companies are very, very big. Mm -hmm. You have the small companies which we have the majority of and then you have the large companies that is only a, a few uh, on a handful so the level there has to be defined and, and again but but the companies out there especially mid-level to high level has to be defined what are our needs in, in that sense yes and then tina actually what anita has been working on a couple of last years is to develop the cyber scare cybersecurity skills framework mm -hmm. to help SMEs to actually define uh, what they need and what kind of job this uh, kind of pro people do usually. Mm. But what Gunnar said about uh, being uh, able for young people to go to companies, this is what we see here in Estonia as well, that people, especially studying in vocational educational institutions, but also in uh, universities, sometimes struggling to find an internship place in 
cybersecurity, it's easier in IT in general. But if you want to do internship in cybersecurity, it's, it's really, really difficult. And uh, companies saying we do need a people, but they're looking for like people who are trained, who have experience, like five years experience, like you said. But they are not willing to take so easily uh, the people who have just graduated. But we have to, somebody has to take them in, in a way so that we will get those people with experience. And this is something that Estonia is now trying uh, with an internship program uh, for public companies. But I think private companies should do more of that. Yeah, Jana, did you have something before? Because then... Yes, um, I was thinking about, uh, well, at the University of Oslo, we, we do not uh, see that kind of uh, lacking collaboration, not uh, from, from my perspective. Uh, like Cisco provide uh, the, uh, uh, materials and uh, courses for students, but you have to pay. So budget is one issue. A budget should never be uh, forgotten in uh, any discussion. I think it's a very and, important And the final, final point is uh, talking about internship and so. In the practical life, uh, most SMEs, they outsource IT operations. So uh, if you want the uh, internship, you have to go to the vendors mm -hmm. to get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted comment? to uh, mention um, uh, a way we try to address the, the problem of uh, getting needs. So we ran, when we set up the Cyber Campus Sweden, we, we ran workshops on education. And uh, we, we, we got some answers, indicative answers, but, but not anything that we could start developing uh, uh, courses for professional training. So we put together the best ideas we had, and we made a fictitious course brochure. You can find it on Cyber Campus Sweden. It's called Agile Education Imagined, where we tried to be, do a realistic offering. But it didn't cost us more than the production of this brochure, uh, but anything in there could de develop. So if a company comes and says, we like this course, uh, we could order uh, 20 positions per year for three years, then we would develop that. Um, mm -hmm. So trying to make it as concrete as possible, it states all the parameters that we need to develop it uh, that I mentioned. So, so um, this is also for you to use in dialogue with uh, companies. You could say, let's start discussing from here, because it's it as concrete as a real course brochure would be. I think that's a... Very good perspective on it. And I also think when we're talking about internships, what we see in Denmark is that consultancy companies like Dubex, uh, et cetera, they can recruit juniors mm. because they have a lot of tasks to be solved mm -hmm. and they can start on, on junior tasks, et cetera. But we experience in the companies where we are solving pressing issues, it's simply two small teams to take in an intern, that, that the resources are not there. And we need to try to see if we can address that in, in, in some way and, and maybe help the companies take on juniors and, and identify how they can provide value. But also that, that demands something of the culture from that uh, company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At Dubex, where our work is very built in, it's a prerequisite. When I start working there, you know, I mean, you have to work together. That's part of the teamwork, and that's a very important part of it. I've also seen companies, I've also been in companies where that time is not there. So if an intern arrives, then they are, most, they are left on their own. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, one of the big problems. And, and if you can do a collaboration with what Gunnar says here, I think that would also be a, a very good step. But the intern also have to learn from that company and be able to, to fulfill some assignments there. So, so that's very important. Mm -hmm. And there is some gaps between there that, that could be bridged somehow. I know this is one of the points that we discussed uh, back in August, that trying to see if we can develop some kind of guideline or material to companies in terms of getting these uh, interns or, or youngsters on, on board. So again, I think this just highlights how the collaboration across borders makes sense, that we get inspired by what you have done, Gona, and, and can look into that. So th this is where it actually makes sense that we're doing this. Then the next topic is early education and community initiatives. And I know it's... A lot of you, it's very close to your heart that we need to do something when we're talking about early education, but also community initiatives that is, uh, what do you say, outside school time uh, that you could go to if, if it's your interest. What is your experience with existing initiatives in your countries? And also, why is it that it plays such a big role? Why is it such an important topic for us to address? Do any of you want to start? I can start. Yeah. <laughs> I think with all those cybersecurity and young uh, actions, we sometimes 
it needs clearer uh, distinction. Like, do we is it awareness raising or is it somebody something what will guide those young people towards career in cybersecurity? Because this will say what kind of topics are we going to discover here. And uh, what I've seen, we do have some uh, awareness raising things, but they sh should be more like spread out evenly to different places. In Estonia, currently, it depends a lot from what kind of teachers are working in school. Do they know about cybersecurity? Can they talk it to their students? Can they help students with simple problems that students are facing? Or is it something that this school has nobody who has this uh, knowledge and can raise their awareness? And also, if you're talking about uh, computer science lessons in Estonia, it's not compulsory. Some schools do it, some schools don't. But what we have seen also is that teachers do not know about working in cybersecurity. What is something when they are talking about their students with cybersecurity, what it is that we should talk about it. And that's uh, something what we actually did in Estonia in this fall. We did a uh, train the trainers kind of program for uh, computer science teachers. And we actually saw that there is really big demand for that. Our registration was full less than 20 hours. It was really fast uh, registration. So we saw that this is something we should address more. and. Uh, we made it in different regions uh, so that the pe teachers who are usually left out because it's far, they're working in rural areas, would get actually access to these trainings uh, as well. And I think with when we are talking about uh, young people themselves, they need a feel of community. Everybody wants to belong somewhere. And uh, when you can go to places and... Uh, solve CTFs like those guys are doing here and goes uh, together, then it's fun for you. You want to do it. You want to be part of that. And also, can we give those options to those who don't want to compete? Uh, so I think we need really diverse kind of places for young people to go. And we need that those people who are working with young people actually have this knowledge. Everybody doesn't have to have this knowledge how uh, to speak about cybersecurity with young people. But every young people should have somebody in their life who can talk to them uh, what is working in cybersecurity and what you should know and do in your computer, in your smartphone mm -hmm. uh, to protect yourself. Yes, and maybe just to supplement. So in this room next to us, uh, a lot of the different countries are sitting there. And we have a Danish team where, at least I know three of them, we have had in our local Danish community for the last uh, six years. Uh, I know one of the guys, when he first met to our first activity six years ago, he didn't know anyone of the people in the community, but he just said, I really think cybersecurity is, is awesome. I want to learn more, but none of the people in my class or school shares the same interest. So the fact that he met a community that uh, embraced him and said, OK, you want to learn more? Here, here is the plate. You just dig in and we'll help you along the way. And now he has been on the national team for the last three years. What is important here is that it's super, it's not super, but it is expensive to have, to have and run and mobilize physical cybersecurity communities. But the value of having these guys in there that will be in the top if of the technical talents, then the value uh, is equal. But it is time consuming and it needs funding, uh, but it's indeed valuable. Mm. Yeah, I have not directly worked with uh, younger pupils. Uh, uh, so um, my take is probably more from my own children and, and, and so forth. But um, don't make it into a course. Don't make it into uh, formal education. We know that school can kill off any interest whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, make it into a hobby activity. Make it into something which is outside school. This is a break from school. It's fun. Um, also, this format here is great, but we need to other formats. Maybe more emphasizing creativity and, and, and skills or um, dramatic skills, writing skills. Um, so it's broader than, than just hacking. Um, um, because that, that, that's one area of it, but, but we need to address the whole. But, but uh, not making it formal, uh, this is, is my main point. Jan? Very happy that you say that, because I disagree. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, had a, a pi we, had, we run several pilots in Norway. We looked to the US and Gen Cyber, and we had uh, American teachers teaching the Norwegian teachers, and we made a full week program 
we had uh, uh, the police, uh, various governmental agencies and uh, people from the comp uh, IT companies. They came and uh, provided lecturing for uh, vocational uh, level students a whole week. I was there talking about critical infrastructure protection. Nobody slept. Mm -hmm. Nobody slept. And on a score one to four to five, on a on a, a score, we got a four, which is very good. And uh, we made also a small diploma. And uh, some of these uh, students, they uh, they were they came next year and they told us that I got that job just because of this diploma, I was the only one that actually knew something about cybersecurity. But then I goes back to, to you that cybersecurity is, well, it's much, much more than just what's going on in the next room here. What's going on in the next room is actually a lagging activity. It's too late when you have to do the pen test after mm -hmm. the products are developed. Th there should be more focused on secure software development and also on risk management and all these soft uh, topics, social science uh, stuff. Yeah, and last? Well, I can come with uh, several examples in Denmark where we have initiatives. Uh, if we start from the very beginning, young people at the age of six to si uh, 17, mm -hmm. we have had uh, or have um, coding pirates, which is uh, an initiative where young people can get together, and that is uh, free of charge. Depends on where you are. Someone charge a little bit of money for it, for, for keeping it running. Um, but, but getting money and f funding for that is fairly easy because a lot of companies out there, they want to put funding into young people. Mm -hmm. So that is very easy. When you get a little bit more up the ladder, so you get um, at, at the communities, at um, cyber skills, as we have talked about, but also at these... Uh, uh, the cyber uh, team we have here, then there is it's driven by uh, the few people. And I think this actually, especially coding pirates, can spark off some initiatives also across the Baltics because it's created by one guy. He went on DTU, which is the, the Danish uh, Technical University, and he thought, we're missing out on this. So he created just like a little forum with, you know, some other... Um, younger guys that could come in there, or, or, and girls especially also. And then, you know, the kids came in, looked at coding, looked at robots, looked at web pages, all the things that got their interest. So it's, it was not a course. It was just, what do you want to learn, actually? Mm -hmm. So that collaboration sparked off that you have old-timers like me that coming in and support the young kids. And that actually creates a lot of fun uh, ideas and, and also the robots that is uh, going on out there. That is what they learn when they attend these um, collaborations, mm -hmm. I would rather say. And I was like, I kind of agree with you, Janet, that there needs to be something that is like uh, equal math and yeah. uh, English or whatever, etc. these uh, elementary courses where they are taught something about cyber awareness. But the, where they're really diving into the interest needs to be outside school. So I kind of agree yeah. with both of you. Mm -hmm. Tina? I kind of agree and disagree at the same time. <laughs> uh, what do you define as a course? What you described as a course is something similar we did in Cyber Research Camp, that we are putting the kids together. We have actually like a plan for them for the week. But we do have some fun activities afternoon as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, you can say it's not a course, because for the kids, it's a camp. But me, as a planner, I do see I have a course like, like between that. And at the same time, uh, CTF Tech, who is organizing this CTF uh, competition, had actually girls uh, kind of course, online course. Uh, and also uh, students get uh, credit points for that. And they can use those credit points afterwards if they're coming to university. And it was uh, when they made a questionnaire about it, it was actually one of the selling points for the participants that if I go to this course, uh, it, this will help me afterwards in my university life. So it can be important as well that it is a formal course. So I think it depends what age group are we talking about it mm -hmm. and how are we putting the package on around that course. Because if you're planning, it can be course, but you can sell it like something different. And it's a design of a project. And a very short comment to that. Yeah, yeah. the point is to make uh, the course for the school very relevant. According, If you are a mechanical 
or uh, electrical engineering, it must be very relevant to the kind of study you have. And I fully agree that uh, 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 volunteer uh, work means a lot. Look at soccer, or uh, not American, but uh, football in Europe. Uh, how many kids doesn't play football? And look at the uh, uh, international level also for girls. Agree on that. And Lars? Well, when you talk about a course, that is usually something that uh, people think of. There is like a, a list that we have to go through, then there is a lot of requirements, and then you get an exam. That can actually scare off people. Mm -hmm. So if you have, as you uh, mentioned there, like an agenda, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And then you also have something that they can form themselves. I think that actually sparks off a lot of initiatives because um, if you give them all the ideas, then they can start thinking on that and form their own ideas and bring that to the mix. I think that is a very important uh, point that you have there. And I think with that said, Lars, I hope that the audience and the one listening in can see that we're here we have four out of 40 members who have opinion on what, what needs to be done and, and what is important to address. But I think this illustrates why we need to gather people from all of the Nordic Baltic countries, use their experience, use their insights into what format have worked well in the different areas, learn from each other, maybe even copy formats, uh, be inspired as, as, uh, as far as we can, and potentially also do collaborative projects together in the future. And as I said to begin with in the presentation, that success, successful executed Projects is built on trust and uh, good collaboration across people. And when we, when you know each other, as we do now, uh, we have a much better foundation. So I think these four and the rest of the 36 members uh, deserves a really big applause because they're investing their time, uh, contributing with the knowledge because they want to make a difference for all of the Nordic and Baltic countries. Thank you very much, all four of you. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Linda, if you can stay with us here on the stage, uh, so I won't let you go yet. Uh, but also I would ask uh, actually Reiner to, uh, to also come and join us here uh, on the stage because it's time now to wrap up the entire day here. But we thought about like uh, usually how different kind of uh, events and, and conferences are ending is that everybody are just saying, you know, thank you very much and then goodbye. But uh, we thought that like as we were leading also uh, the three different uh, panel discussions to kind of reflect back what we learn today and what would uh, be the main kind of uh, outcomes of, of this event as well because again uh, we're organizing this already third year uh, but I hope also these discussions are actually you know leading to some kind of actions later as well. So uh, I started uh, today when uh, I did the opening remarks uh, just bringing some of the numbers and, uh, and like I said there is four million people uh, missing working in cybersecurity around one, one million here, uh, here in Europe. And uh, just some of the statistics, only in 12 countries out of 27 in Europe, cybersecurity is part of official curriculum, which is like basically nothing. Uh, at the same time, now we've been focusing on, you know, the Nordic side, the Nordic Baltic uh, side, which is again in, in, uh, in through a lot of kind of different conversations that we had today, uh, was brought it out as well that uh, actually we are the leading region here uh, that uh, is putting most of the focus and then he's trying to do as much as possible to especially start again with, you know, teachers uh, and making sure that they would have enough skills to actually help the students. And then, of course, also making it more attractive for students to, you know, learn more about the skills. And again, when it comes to AI and it's also involvement in, in the entire cybersecurity field, then really helping the students to uh, to learn these skills and, and even organizing events like we have today as well here. So I think in, in terms of like the future steps as well, uh, we should stay as, as a leading region here, but of course also supporting the rest of the Europe. Uh, so I think uh, again, uh, the think tank uh, that is also, you know, made by the Nordic Council of Ministers is, is in incredible and, and really that we can share these best practices, what is working, what is not working. And I feel especially for my panel, the main take 
takeaway there was was really that in order to get rid of this kind of fear and misunderstanding of, of AI and its role in cybersecurity and in general like you know mess and disinformation uh, campaigns and being a bit like more aware uh, what's happening around us and how to really use this uh, techno technological solutions as as more uh, as as kind of opportunities for us to to uh, to be better uh, to do better uh, so we really do have to invest as much as possible into education but again starting with the teachers uh, because they are at the end of the day the ones that are helping our students across in different either it's in a high school level either it's a university level uh, or even like kindergarten as is in Estonia we also do a lot of robotic classes for uh, for students uh, not the students but but small kids in uh, in, in the kindergarten so that they would start as early as possible and, and would have this interest coming as, as early as possible. And I, especially as you brought it out as well, like there are still very few women in the sector. So I feel also, again, in our Nordic uh, Scandinavian side of the world, we should lead the way and show that it's okay to be a woman and, and be standing and talking about this, uh, these matters because that's, uh, that's something that is very essential. And again, I now I was just talking, but, but maybe reflection also uh, from your panel, what was the main takeaway? And, and especially if you could kind of reflect this to the audience and saying that we have people, again, from the policy sector, people that have backgrounds of law, uh, people that are educators, uh, hopefully some of the students also with us here. Um, so some of the recommendations, what they should, if they go home today uh, and, and, and they go back to either work or school or, you know, whatever they, they, uh, they spend there every day, uh, what they should do differently. Uh, should they invest their time more in, into something or, or just kind of the key takeaways for, for this entire event that we had? Thank you. Like, from the perspective of uh, what we discussed in the legal and ethical uh, panel, first of all, uh, I guess the key takeaway is that the world has changed a lot really fast. Uh, we see that the legal system is kind of resolving those issues, but not in a perfect way. Uh, the key takeaway, what everybody should think about is, first, uh, when you use AI, know what you're doing, but... Uh, don't think that it does your job. Uh, from the perspective of what we should teach the youth, uh, we should absolutely 100% uh, push them to use it as soon as possible. However, it has to be controlled. So uh, they must understand the tool. You don't teach the tool by forbidding it. You teach the tool by giving them the tool in some settings and not in others. They need to understand that they have to know the contract between them and the AI, and they have to understand what, uh, what are the rights they have with uh, the creation. From the perspective of uh, the part of discussion that we had about hacking, the key takeaways are that we have to teach that ethical intent doesn't mean that the hacking itself is ethical. The ground, the legal ground for, for the hack is the way you see it as ethical hacking or white hat hacking. And we need to teach this principle. And also we need to teach the youth to understand the, the terms that are relevant to different bug bounty programs and so forth. So these are from the content but on a wider scale, uh, we are in a really bad situation, in my opinion, where uh, we are talking about a topic that's uh, really moving fast. Uh, I, being from a competitive sector, I say that we are not able to change the school system like, just like this. So we need teacher activism. They need to be the active parts pushing these topics already in, even if they're not in the curriculum. And we need also like, systematic work, changing and updating the curriculum, because there's a lot you can learn from everywhere, but uh, your tools must be modern. 
Yeah. And I especially wanted to bring one more thing as well, uh, is in terms of like the policy making side, either if it's creating new laws or again, the new policies that are regulating the use either of the AI or also the cyber international laws that need to be implemented in, in a lot of senses as well. Like, and again, encouraging, because I've been sitting on a, on a side of the table that I've been writing these policies. And I think the biggest thing there, because I don't know the entire market, so how can I write the policies and the laws that are right for the market? Mm -hmm. and and that's, again, getting all the stakeholders on a table that actually are able to give uh, their kind of, uh, you know, input there as well and really telling us what needs to be done, what are the threats that they are facing and how we can educate each other also in a lot of ways there. So, so that's, I, I think, also kind of the part that I, I wanted to bring it out as well. But, but Linda, uh, from your side as well, you ended a panel discussion with, you know, uh, about the entire job that happens that, that you do at the think tank and so on. So what would be your kind of recommendations? And you already said uh, to you, all, all of these people as well, that if there is anybody in this market that wants to be part of this, reach out and like we can we can find a place for, for everybody in that sense, but, but maybe just come up the takeaways or suggestions from our side. So I think I, I will want to address the different target groups listening in. So dear policymakers who listen to, to us on the stage, I hope you heard that we need support for this work. Uh, we need There needs to be funding for collaboration uh, across borders. There needs to be funding in the respective countries for pilot projects, not only for the long term, but we need to get going tomorrow uh, with initiatives if we need to face the, the challenges and, and, and the threat landscape that we're seeing. So please work on that in the respective countries. We'll do our best to make some recommendation and, and you can see that we have very motivated people. Then for the students uh, in this room or our youngsters in, in school, I hope you have enjoyed the cyber battle on, on, on this side, but I also hope that you heard the members talking about that this is not only the the only thing you can do when talking about cybersecurity, that we're seeing a lot of challenges that uh, needs to be addressed out of uh, in the companies and organization, because cybersecurity lives in all of the departments. It's not isolated to people working with very uh, technical areas within cybersecurity. So we need you, even if you think that um, you're interested into communication and marketing, there is a role for you working with cyber awareness. If you're interested in law and in, in this field, there is a, a job for you within government risk and compliance and so forth. So please have an open mind to cybersecurity because it's such a, a broad field and we really need motivated young people to, uh, to pursue this way. Then for the teachers, I also hope you heard uh, the members saying, we need you. We need you as good ambassadors for the kids, uh, training them uh, with skills within cybersecurity. But we also know that it's a big challenge because you don't know, not necessarily have the skills to do it. The good part is that there is lots of good uh, basis uh, material uh, accessible. Um, if you don't have it in your given country, I know that you can visit Inisa's uh, webpage where they have actually mapped uh, all of the different educational material that they uh, know of in the different countries and you can map it by language etc. Um, so I hope you get some confidence in that you can also teach even though you don't have an education within it. And maybe you can write us if you need inspiration for what we have done in other countries or need access to material. So I hope you go out of this room and are, are inspired to do more. For the companies listening in, I really hope that uh, you heard that you need to take on a responsibility because we need you, we need your cooperation together with academia uh, in terms of that the students get a, a realistic idea of what does it mean to work with cybersecurity and what are the incidents actually about, what are they going to tackle in, in the real world, um, and also that you cannot always hire a, um, a profile with five years of experience. We also need the juniors to, to get out to get internships and, and junior jobs, and you have a responsibility uh, on this side as well. So I hope you are motivated to work on, on that as well in, in your organization. So I think with that said, yes. that was the reflection from our side. Yeah, uh, I saw that Reiner uh, Sorry, wanted to say something additionally Actually, as well. Lina, you inspired me <laughs> to give a message to teachers as well. Uh, teachers and lawyers have the same vocational disease, perfectionism. You must do everything perfect because... The grades are given based on performance. But the problem with that is that you st like put the bar for yourself also really, really high. Uh, but with these topics where the world is moving actually too fast, throw the perfectionism out of the window. Be rather there for the discussion uh, and be open to discuss topics 
perhaps you don't know 100% about because this creates more value than deciding not to talk because you don't know the full thing. You are not able to know the full thing because what you learned yesterday is already outdated tomorrow in this business. And in terms of especially for the international collaboration as well, there's something that I've always bring, brought it out as well when I've been speaking in different stages, is that it doesn't matter if it's a company that is working with different partners or is it a country that is part of either the EU or NATO, the weakest country or the weakest organization or the weakest employee in your company with lacking of knowledge in cybersecurity will define how strong your entire organization, your country, or your company is. And that's kind of the sad reality. And that's why, again, the skill cap side is a huge problem that we need to find solution as soon as possible and, and really trying to find investments and, and, and experts. And, and I really liked also even calling like an ambassadors in this sector that are the spokespeople in, in, in this sector and really attracting more and more young people to join this, uh, join this world of cyber because it's kind of cool, right? All right. Uh, but now it's actually really the time to wrap everything up here. Uh, so from my side, I would like to say a massive, massive, massive thank you to everybody who joined us here, either today, today in a room or also virtually. We had more than 2,000 people uh, online also listening to uh, us. So that is a very big number, and I'm very, very happy about that. Uh, and of course, also to all of the organizers, uh, so uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers and also C uh, CTF uh, Tech that has been part of this event as well. And then, of course, all the speakers and moderators of, of to, uh, today's event as well. It wouldn't have been possible uh, without uh, you. So uh, if you could join me now for a massive round of applause for everybody that had been part of this uh, event as well today. And, and maybe if just as a last uh, kind of sentence, so really, if you go home, do something differently that you did yesterday. Uh, so really take something uh, from this event. And we really do hope that these discussions will not just end here in this room, but also will continue outside and will inspire people to actually do better and be better. So enjoy the rest of the day and go check also the award ceremony at uh, 4.30. So thank you. Thank you very much.